A very warm good morning uh, to everyone present there and joining us today. We had a very fantastic discussion on day one of the virtual CME for uh, on clinical updates for doctors in rural service conducted by the St. John's Medical College Alumni Association. Welcome on the big day, which is the football final day. And like we said before, probably more than half the world is rooting for Messi. But we are not going to make it a messy affair. And we are going to be starting off with an exciting academic feast lined up for you this Sunday morning. We have a slight change in schedule due to the technical, a few technical glitches we are presenting. And I'm proud to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Grancy Montero. He's from the batch of 2009 from St. John's Medical College, UG, and then went on to do his PG in MS General Surgery from St. John's Medical College. He's uh, been someone who is very passionate and who has been dedicated to the cause of rural service. And uh, right now he's working in St. Joseph's Mission Hospital in Wynard as such. And no better person really to talk about minor procedures in the OPD from a surgical viewpoint in the rural service. Grancy, over to you. Good morning, Nathan. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, perfect. Uh, George, if you can just put Grancy's presentation on the stream, if it's loaded. Uh, Grancy, you can start. And please post your questions in the chat box and we will have an interactive session at the end of uh, Dr. Grancy's session. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I would like to start the a small conversation rather on minor surgical procedures in the OPD. Um, so majority of our OPD patients do have issues or problems which are or can be addressed in the OPD itself. Um, and we've noticed that majority of the patients who do come to our OPD come with problems which do not really require a major OT or do not require specified equipment or anything fancy to deal with their problems and it can be addressed at the OPD itself uh, and compared to what I when 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 I started my clinical postings and to what uh, surgery has been doing in the OPD these days there are a lot of things which can be sorted out in the OPD itself uh, so there is a significant reduction in patient burden which is a good thing for a large tertiary care hospital like St. John's when we have smaller bond centers or when we have rural centers which can address these issues uh, so when we uh, there there are a lot of problems which say some, something like an infectious sebaceous cyst which when ignored can go on to become a larger problem leading into major surgery on in a tertiary care hospital so a lot of uh, surgical burden can be reduced when you address this in opd itself so um, this is not a definition per se uh, according to textbooks what in general what is a minor procedure versus a major procedure a broad definition would be uh, it is fairly simple to execute requires minimum equipment and manpower does not really require any kind of monitoring post procedure does not require any hospitalization and definitely does not require any specialized training so when you talk about uh, minor procedures or in 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 fact even surgery in a rural setup what you need to understand what is your setup in your hospital you need to be honest about what you can or cannot do in your setup what is the equipment which is available for you on a day-to-day -day basis um, is there any help if something goes wrong do you have any help uh, from the opd or, or around you someone who can guide you and in general, what are the requirements? The requirements would be a small OPD, probably a, a staff nurse who can assist you with the procedure. Uh, some basic instrument, usually a dressing tray, few instruments like an artery, uh, forceps, some gauze, some gauze pad, some suture material would do. Uh, there are some procedures which I would be talking about, which can be done in the OPD, but might require certain other instruments. So that will be in the latter half of what the presentation so according to me this is at the top from the top of my head when uh, when i just sat down to do this uh, the procedures which can be done in an opd uh, which i can think of is excisions like lipoma sebaceous cysts ganglion stone nail excisions 
simple procedures like incision and drainage minor wound debridement can definitely be done and these are the few things which i mentioned that you needed certain instruments certain specific instruments to do like sclerotherapy and banding for hemorrhoids uh, for keloids i have specifically put this i'm pretty sure dermatologists uh, will be also doing this procedure but where i did my bond in chatarpur uh, for the first half of the year uh, a lot of patients did not have access to even a uh, basic phc so they ended up coming to us with a lot of keloids and they had extremely good results with that over time so word spread and a lot of patients would come even on a regular opd days to get injection trams in along uh, and over time we saw great results uh, fnac biopsy or core needle biopsy which also can be done uh, again it depends on whether you're going to operate the patient or not but if you can it would be great if you could offer a true cut biopsy when you have a suspicious breast lump few biopsies and fnacs in uh, in cases of long standing ulcers when you have to send a wedge biopsy you can do that um, again for certain other instruments that are required for these kind of procedures but majority of these procedures usually can be done in a rural setup so i would just show you some pictures of uh, uh, some swellings which we generally on day to day basis deal with uh, in the opd and this is nothing but a sebaceous cyst as you can see and that is an excised specimen of the same with the wedge of skin on the top so uh, this is a pictorial presentation of the same where you can see that there is a cyst you inject a local anesthetic around it make an elliptical incision usually uh, try and involve the punctum along your incision excise if possible the entire cyst in toto and try and not leave a cyst wall behind sometimes it does get left behind and that can lead to recurrence uh similarly this same sebaceous cyst like i said earlier can lead to an infection an abscess when left unchecked and uh, can become a major problem we are dealing right now with a child who had come with a small sebaceous and had gone to the district hospital here with a small sebaceous cyst which was neglected got infected uh now we had to do a major debridement uh, over the back uh with a lot of uh, sloughed off tissue we had to do uh uh vac dressing for a prolonged period of time and then we had to graft this is a 12 year old child uh, child who lost a lot of good time uh, a schooling time this is this is a time where a lot of exams happen so it she literally lost half a year with just a simple diagnosis could have saved her a lot of time so this is what i was talking about an infectious infected sebaceous cyst which would require just a simple ind uh coming to the second most common thing uh which we encounter in opd which usually uh patients mistake as a tumor or cancer and they come very with great apprehension when they actually encounter this um if you're fortunate there is usually one lipoma which is uh, dealt with with a simple excision but some patients do come with dercums which is nothing but painful lipomatosis or multiple lipomatosis all over the body so usually there are only two indications one is when the patient requires or or wants to get it done or if it is cosmetically disfiguring so if it is over any skin exposed areas or if it's over the hands or if it's over pressure areas like the elbow so usually these are the requests we get for excision it is a fairly simple uh, procedure to be done but one thing you have to notice uh, in next picture i can show you you can see that uh, once the excision is done once you have broken all the loculi and the uh, lipoma is out you usually if it's a long standing lipoma there is a stem to the lipoma which is attaching it to deeper tissue and usually a vessel courses through so always be observant about these things and try and uh, ligate it before you excise the lipoma because it can lead into 
a lot of torrential bleeding. Uh, this is another very common thing which we see in OPD. We see a lot of diabetics, a lot of patients with a lot of uh, 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 PVD patients, children who come with uh, ingrown natonil. So there are various procedures which uh, have been described since 1920s. Uh, the Venograd procedure, which had come into existence in 1929 and still existence. Um, so there is ZX procedure, which we have all heard about. So I won't really go into uh, how to do the procedure or the name procedures. Let's just talk about partial toenail excision and a complete toenail excision. When do you do what? So when there is a toenail which is ingrowing, and especially it's on the lateral side, we can go ahead with a venograd procedure, which is nothing but uh, here you can see that the toenail is ingrown on the medial side. So put a nick along that area, the towards the germinal area, you excise the nail on the lateral side and then suture the nail. Some, some, some surgeons suture the nail along with the soft tissue. Some people just uh, approximate the soft tissue to the skin. So what happens, is, and uh, before you do the suturing, you generally scoop out the germinal layer. It's called matrix, matrixectomy. So the idea is to make sure that the toenail which comes uh, is a healthy toenail. Now, some issues when we do a uh, ingrown toenail, some patients come with fungal paranoia. So usually we do have to cover it with antifungals for a long period of time, which usually patients are not compliant with. Uh, prolonged periods of time, they do not take medication. So it is a problem which will keep recurring. So you have to be very careful in your counseling because they will ask you one, one favorite word in rural setup is guarantee of anything. So please do not promise anything uh, of such sort because it's a very recurrent condition. So this is like I said, the Westergrad uh, method. So uh, when do you do a uh, wedge resection or whole, uh, whole nail removal? Um, if you ask me, there is no hard and fast guidelines uh, regarding this. But a uh, general thing is you see the condition of the nail and not just the soft tissue around it. You see the condition of the nail. If the nail is brittle, if it's already deformed, then the patient would benefit with a whole nail removal. Otherwise, a wedge resection is usually enough for an ingrown toenail. Uh, another very common procedure, I think every intern has probably done it in their uh, undergrad years, is an IND. I hope uh, a surgery department has given everyone a chance to do a simple IND at least. Uh, so this, I think this procedure is well known to all of you. Just put a cruciate incision break all left loculi, make sure that area is open. Some people do prefer uh, putting a, a gauze piece and packing the wound so that it granulates from within, does not close and does not cause any kind of uh, collection. But I prefer not to do it. Uh, just a simple gauze piece is enough so that it drains well. Make sure that the, the ulcer is opened well and the locula is broken that's the main idea and do not do not do not at under any circumstance suture the wound uh, this is uh, again a uh, napsis secondary to an ingrown uh, nail um, i'll show you with the next diagram this is from netters uh, you can see the abscess at the base of the nail yeah, you can either give a ring block uh, and uh, do it, or you can give a local anesthetic to the area and try and drain the abscess uh, along the nail bed. Now, some people do ask me whether you can do both a toe nail, uh, a nail excision along with uh, an IND. Uh, depends on how badly uh, deformed the nail is. But otherwise, you can give a trial of doing an incision and drainage and then probably excising the nail in total. So few procedures which uh, can uh, need to be, uh, you need to have certain instruments uh, 
in your OPD, which all rural hospitals might not be having, is for a sclerotherapy, you need a sclerosent. It could be 5% phenol, it could be hypertonic saline, but it's very easily available now. And you need an insulin syringe. You need a proctoscope and a, an assistant, preferably, who will help you stabilize the proctoscope when you give the sclerosent. Band ligation, uh, again, you will require a scope which will show you with a light uh, source where you can ligate by using a rubber band. And true cut biopsy, you'll probably require a true cut gun, uh, which is expensive. So uh, what we do in our hospital is we use the same true cut gun after sterilizing about four, five to six patients till the needle gets blunt. And it does help a lot because the nearest hospital from even though I I wouldn't say mine is the perfect rural area but then if you are from uh, if if the transport to the nearest hospital is about five to six hours then and you have surrounding labs around it is good to uh, give the patient a benefit of that get a biopsy done so that when the patient comes back he can go back with a fixed report. Whether you offer him surgery after that or not, he at least has a diagnosis. He or she has a diagnosis. Uh, this is a pictorial presentation of a banding. This is a sclerotherapy, which we uh, usually sclerosent is given at the base of the hemorrhoids. These procedures uh, would be you would it would be prudent to uh, attempt all these procedures after a certain amount of time, after you spend a certain amount of time with the help of another surgeon, once you are confident, once you've done enough procedures under supervision, I think this is a very good procedure uh, to benefit patients. Because uh, a lot of patients, I think our dietary habits are such that a lot of patients come with uh, first degree and secondary degree hemorrhoids. And you can actually give them a lot of relief with these two procedures. So this is a true cut biopsy gun. Uh, I'm sure you would have seen few procedures being done in our department as well as elsewhere. Uh, no one really offers an FNAC now. The gold standard right now to do is a core needle biopsy, which gives you a lot of information when it comes to a suspicious breast lump. A true cut biopsy can be done for other non-vascular swellings also. Uh, but for reference sake, I have just mentioned a breast lump. And it would be great if you could just start off with doing a true cut biopsy for a breast lump. Um, the other procedures, like I said, injection triumphs in a lawn for keloids, excellent results. It's a very simple procedure. You have to just inject it at the base of the keloid till the tissue blanches. And you might require about six to seven months for uh, good results. And over time, uh, it avoids uh, the thing is if you offer surgery a lot of patients come to you with uh, various opinions um, as of now at least there is no surgical procedure which can guarantee a non-recurrence for a keloid so because the idea is any kind of tissue damage will progress to a keloid in such a patient because of the predisposition uh, coming to suturing uh, primary or secondary suturing a lot of patients come with uh, say an incised wound, a laceration. So simple suturing can be done in the OPD basis itself if you have adequate hemostasis and if you're sure there is no vascular or uh, neurological insult. So you would require basic suture material like Vicryl. I'm sure all, all rural hospitals these days do have Vicryl and Ethylon, um, but some still, still do not have it. So when you are not sure whether you can do a good job, Try and give a good wash. If you cannot do anything, try and give a good wash before you refer to a hospital where they can suture it. Secondly, suturing a lot of the uh, laparotomy wounds where we do not close the skin can come to you. It's another procedure which is fairly simple. You anesthetize the skin edges and you can do a good secondary suturing. Uh, this is a procedure which we do in OPD basis. Again, it would require a certain level of surgical training. But uh, it's another procedure which we are doing a lot in our OPD setup and we do not admit the patient. We call the patient in the morning, we do it as an OPD procedure and send the patient home in this OPD duration itself. Um, 
a very uh, satisfying procedure to do in the sense that uh, the patients are happy that they do not have to stay. It's not even a daycare surgery. You don't, do not even have to stay for that long. Uh, but again, like I said, it requires a certain degree of training, uh, which I'm sure uh, all your rural hospitals will offer you. Usually nowadays, all rural hospitals do have a surgical cover, but if you do not have, please do not attempt to do this. Uh, but if you have a surgeon who can train you, this is also a procedure you can do in the OPD. Uh, so I, I just wanted to briefly touch upon uh, issues, uh, the limitations in terms of manpower, resources and equipment. Please understand uh, that you know your hospital the best. You know what are the limitations. You know yourself the best. You know what you can or cannot do. So if you can do a procedure, if you have assisted enough, go ahead and do it. If you do not have the manpower resources or equipment, uh, try and refer the patient to a person who can or to a surgeon who can do it. Usually, I do not prefer giving antibiotics to most of my procedures unless and until it's an IND. And please, please do take a consent for uh, minor OT procedures also because it can... Uh, there have been instances where small procedures have been done without consent and they have gone on to become a legal issue for the hospital. And you're just budding rural surgeons. There are a few of us who have just started off uh, in a rural area. So try to be safe. Always take a consent. It can be a consent on a simple uh, OPD folder, but do take an informed consent. And always do even a minor OT procedure. Please do in the presence of an attender. There has to be an attender available when the procedure is done. So yeah, clear, please clearly understand what you can and cannot do in a hospital. Start with simple procedures and progress from there. Try and work it. Uh, yeah, this is one thing which uh, I would advise for all the uh, young doctors. Please try and work on adult patients in the beginning. And when in doubt, definitely ask a senior like Nitin. Uh, or Dr. Royce for that matter. So you have a lot of help at your disposal. You have WhatsApp groups, which, uh, are, which will always be there for your help. So please, please ask for help whenever help is required, even if it is in between an OPD. And communicate. Communicate with your patient about what you're going to do. And that's how job half done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Granji, for that wonderful talk. We are just trying to wait for the uh, for uh, Dr. Granji. Please uh, put the the box as such. Uh, Grancy, my one question is, I mean, you almost sounded like Albus Dumbledore out there saying help will be given to all those who ask for it at Hogwarts. So help will always be given at the St. John's Alumni Association for those who always ask for it. But on a more serious note, one of the questions that I had was what were some of the difficult surgical procedures that you have done in OPD where you started doing the procedure uh, but then you suddenly went, oh, gosh, I feel I should not have done it at this point of time. Uh, but I had a procedure yesterday, which was kind of difficult. There was a large thyroid. And uh, my consultant here usually does uh, FNACs here itself in the OPD. Uh, and it was the first uh, attempt for me. Uh, I have never done uh, non-guided FNACs for thyroid because thyroids can be really vascular. So this was a patient which we did an FNAC and uh, we finished the FNAC, we put the patient outside and the patient developed a large hematoma within minutes. So some of the procedures uh, which can really put you in soup is FNACs on a very vascular organ like thyroid gland. So always try and avoid such situations and uh, other thing which I mentioned is about lipomas. See, uh, if it's a small lipoma, if you're very sure it's in a very uh, uh, straightforward area, that's okay. 
but there are some lipomas which you will find at the medial aspect of your thigh or areas which are very close to vascular structures try and avoid them so yes bleeding is a problem for any procedure so but please please try and be a little careful when you're dealing with uh, uh, simple procedures which can be to devastating consequences if not done the right way so yes uh, any proximity to a vascular structure or a vascular organ is uh, can give problems Uh, Gansi, the other question that the bonders are asking is um, what exactly uh, would be a good video resource or textbooks uh, Gansi, to follow for um, uh, doing procedures in the OPD? I think Sophia can take it from here if she has something to add on to that. One of the resources is uh, there is a YouTube channel for rural surgery. There are a lot of uh, uh, YouTube channels which have uh, been describing or have been describing a lot of simple procedures like lipoma excision, sebaceous cysts. Uh, but like I said, nothing like you doing it, nothing like you actually seeing and learning from uh, by practice. So if you've done simple procedures in your hospital, I'm sure you're able to replicate it. Now, when it comes to banding or sclerotherapy, um, there are again YouTube sources. Textbooks, again, would not give you a very clear picture practically, but if you have uh, 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 any labs or any kind of uh, hospital nearby where they do procedures like banding or sclerotherapy, spend some time with the surgeon or the doctor there, learn the procedure and then replicate in your other one. So there's, not, there's no substitute to practice per se when it comes to uh, minor OD procedures. But yes, there are a lot of videos on YouTube which can help. Nitin, I can't hear you. Yeah, if there are any more comments or questions, uh, please do post them in the chat box for Grancy to answer. Or, of course, you can always post in our WhatsApp group or personally messages. Uh I think Nitin has lost connection. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the questions are most welcome. If they have placing it, we will take uh, Dr. Gransri. Yeah. Dr. Gransri? Yeah, I, I do not think there are any more questions. I'm not. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitin and the Alumni Association for this opportunity. It was great talking to you all. I will be logged in. I probably will ask my questions to the other speakers whenever I can. Thank you. Have a great day. It was great talking to you all. I will be logged in. I will ask my questions to the other speakers. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Gransley, for the... Yeah, for the wonderful sharing that you have done. Yeah. Hello, Nidhi. Dr. Gransley?
Hello, Dr. Grancy. Hello, Dr. Grancy already left, I think. He has done wonderfully presented well. Hello. Hello, Joanites, rural service. Those who are doing for your great job for that, we are doing this one. Any doubt and any queries you can put forth. If uh, Grancy is online, please. You can show yeah, up. So, so we, yeah, so, so we will just uh, move on to the next part. I would just like to remind everyone who has joined in uh, that uh, please do post your name, your badge, and the center you're working in the comment box because if you have registered previously for the KMC accreditation, uh, this is very important to show as the uh, proof. Uh, uh, I would like to request George to uh, please put our next speaker on stream as such. Uh, George, if you can put Dr. Anne on the stream as such. Right. Uh, one of the most important challenges in the rural setup is dealing with children and more importantly in dealing with seizures as such. And no better person uh, today than to, ad uh, to address this topic uh, than Dr. Anne, uh, who is a consultant neurologist at Synapse. Uh, she's really a pioneer in the field of pediatric neurology, doing wonderful work with uh, how to approach pediatric seizures, working with NGOs on follow-up of children with seizures in the rural area. Uh, we also have uh, read with a lot of pride her work with the spinal muscular atrophy with children. Uh, so really, thank you, Dr. Ann, for taking time off on Sunday morning to join us for this, uh, what I'm sure is going to be a wonderful talk. Uh, if you could just share your presentation uh, and then we would be able to start off. Thank you, Dr. Nitin and the Alumni Association of Johns. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's just loading. Yes, we are able to see it. Okay, thank yeah. you to all of you, especially the young Johnites and anybody else who's not Johnite who's joined. And uh, thank you particularly for the young people who are serving in the villages and, and in the rural areas that are less served in our country. You are doing a great job. Uh, so something, I'm try, I, uh, please feel free to to stop me at any point. I understand that this is a very heterogeneous audience. So I've tried to keep it into, uh, divided it into two, co four concepts. So an over overview of this talk is going to be something about seizures and what it means, some basic concepts, something about seizure mimics, because we are always guilty of over-diagnosing or under-diagnosing epilepsy. And this is not, nobody is exempt from this. So the error rate of, la of wrong diagnosis of epilepsy in children for a pediatrician is 20%. If you're a good pediatrician, it should not be more than 20%. 20% is a big number. The error rate for a pediatric neurologist is 4%. So we too make mistakes. All of us make mistakes. So the entire game is about making sure that you're not making too many mistakes and going on reviewing patients because if the same child with a seizure can have a non-epileptic seizure. So we'll be looking at more of that. The concept of seizure versus seizure mimic. Something about febrile seizures, because I'm sure this is the bane of our existence. There will be plenty of this around. And something about how to rationalize investigations, particularly when resources are difficult. Resources are difficult in, in rural areas, but it's also difficult in cities. How to rationalize them, when to give them, what is the best thing to do? So some something to get right, seizure versus epilepsy. Because having one seizure is not necessarily epilepsy. So seizure is, means any sudden event. Remember, these are events that are unpredictable. So anything that happens that seizes the individual, so the, I'm putting it as a, from a practical definition. I'm not putting it as a textbook definition. So they often happen unwitnessed. You do not have people standing around uh, watching them. So then what happens is that um, you don't get reliable witnesses or reliable historians and people, there's always a lot of panic and, and excitation around that. So versus an epileptic seizure. So I'm asking you all to think about this. So every seizure need not necessarily be an epileptic seizure. Then the concept of epilepsy. So epilepsy is something that you need to treat. A seizure is not necessarily something you need to treat. We do not know, is it originating from the brain? If it's with cortical activity, then that is epileptic seizure. But you may have syncope, you may have a non-epileptic attack disorder. So all of those things are, are not technically epileptic seizures. So your anti-epileptic medication will not work on that. 
And then even if it's an epileptic seizure, so like for example, it's a febrile seizure, it may not constitute epilepsy. So then we are doing a disservice to the child in treating that child. So these are three things. You're narrowing it down, saying seizures, most of them are not, some of them are not going to be epileptic seizure, but even if they're an epileptic seizure, they may not be epilepsy. So an epileptic seizure is a manifestation or manifestations of epileptic, which means excessive or hypersynchronous activity neuron, which are usually self-limiting. So you very rarely get status epilepticus. If you get status epilepticus, most of them terminate by themselves or are one is able to terminate them. Only a very, very, very small minority go on to become refractory status epilepticus. So most of them are self-limited activity of the neurons in the brain. So today we are speaking mostly, largely I'm trying to target epilepsies. And I'm using the term epilepsies. And some of you may be familiar with this. The reason being the term epilepsy is not one entity. It's not one disease. It's a very heterogeneous group of disorders. So it refers to a group of different neurological conditions. The only thing that they have in common is that they have a tendency for recur recurrent epileptic seizures, meaning seizures that are caused by hypersynchronous abnormal neurological electrical discharges. Remember the medications that we're giving, why are we using these definitions? We are not using these definitions for being pedantic. Medicine is a very practical science. We are doing this because this is how we're going to manage these children. So your anti-epileptics are, are based on medications that will control calcium and other ion channel influx and efflux. And that's how it controls discharges. And that's how it stabilizes the membranes of your neurons. And so giving it unnecessarily, it's not good. And you'd have to know where to use it. So that's why that's the only thing in common. So you want to know as a doctor, can you use anti-epileptic or not? So epilepsies, they're different. Why they're different? We'll speak more about it later. So this is a picture to remind ourselves that this is this abnormal electrical activity, which is what is captured in EG, which can look daunting in that it looks so difficult to interpret. So just to bring to mind, the incidence of epilepsy in our country is around 2%. This is a lot higher than in Western countries and more developed countries. In more developed countries, it's around 0.5%. So it's we have almost four times that. And this is this varies from region to region. So if you're working in an area, a rural area, which has got, does not have very good uh, you know, perinatal care, then they may have more infant, infant mobility, more HIE and things. So more disability, more hypoglycemia, then you have higher incidence of epilepsy. So the incidence of febrile seizures universal all over the world, it's 5%. So yeah, febrile seizures more common than epilepsy per se. So I would want you all to, if nothing else, take away this point. So try and remember that there is a five axis description for how to describe epilepsy. And in this five axis way, one, two, three, four, five, you can always write, don't know, don't know, don't know. But it's important to have this five axis and then say, every time the child comes back, revisit. This is the only way to reduce errors. So first axis is, you're describing the phenomenology, the ictal phenomenology, meaning what actually happened when the seizure was happening. Then you're also classifying whether it is epileptic or non-epileptic. When you go into the detail, why is it that even pediatric neurologists who are epilepsy specialists, even we make mistakes in recognizing seizures. So there is always, always, for everything that looks like an epilepsy, there is a epi non-epileptic thing that looks, that's a mimic. So always remember that. So every time your first access is, question yourself, get the description. Description is what our teachers used to tell us, that you know, you're, you're, not, you're not using medical jargon. You're saying, what did they do? They lost consciousness. They you know, turned their head to one side. They jerked their hand, whatever it is that they did. So that is your phenomenology of what happened. And then you're again questioning yourself, yes or no, do you think this came from the brain or not? That's the first axis. That's axis number one. Second one is seizure type. Only then go to, is it GTCS? Is it focal? Is it absence? Is it, so terms like partial and things are, are a little bit obsolete, but still that's, that is your seizure type. So you go to your seizure type, that's your second axis. But before that, you're going to ask yourself the question, wait a second, is this epilepsy or not? Next is, next comes axis three, which is syndrome. So why is this important? Because we are always dealing with electroclinical syndromes. So electroclinical syndromes in the sense that if you have a child who has an epilepsy for no reason whatsoever, 
MRI is normal, developmentally normal, then you would call it, you would know that most epilepsies are treatable and that this might be an epilepsy that will self-terminate. You know that it will self-terminate, resolve in two to three years of time. So that you would call as something called as a generalized idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Or if it is something like a Rolandic epilepsy, or it is a cerebral palsy child who presented with epilepsy, then that is your syndrome, meaning there is a lesion in the brain. This is a symptomatic or a lesional epilepsy. So that is your axis three. Why is this important? Is that the, the child with a lesion in the brain, you will treat differently to the child with a, uh, with a no lesion, completely normal child who has had no seizure for two years to a, versus a child who's had no seizures but has got a lesion in the brain. Both are different. So that's axis three. Axis four is what is the cause? Axis five is this is something as doctors, and this is something that St. John's teaches us as well, as what is relevant. It's not as doctors, we are not just treating the seizure. There are often unsaid things which the families are not aware of. These are people who would have behavioral, emotional impairment. They fall through the cracks. They don't do very well in school. These are the ones whose marriages fall apart when they grow older and become adults, and they're not able to hold jobs. So they have more social, social disability. But it is up to us to be able to help improve their quality of life. This is access five. So let's, as people who give care to children with epilepsy, let's not forget this because that's very, very important. So epilepsy in childhood, I'm just touching on a few subheadings, neonatal seizures, focal seizures, because they're from one part of the brain, for generalized seizures, generally involving the whole of the brain, and something about epilepsy syndromes. Epilepsy syndromes are too vast a topic, but we'll just touch something on it. And something about neurocutaneous stigmata. So this is something that we all learned in pathology, tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis. There are a plethora of them, but we'll just take some examples of this. So for those who are interested in reading, the International League Against Epilepsy is a body that is constantly fighting against epilepsy. So this is a position paper that is available freely on the internet. This is from 2017 in Epilepsy. So this is on the classification. And you would notice that every few years, we keep on changing the classification because we believe it improves us in handling and dealing with these children. Then there is the operational classification, like what we did before. We, we had an operational classification. That's not a textbook classification on, for us, is it coming from the brain or not? Your question as a doctor is, do I need to treat it or not? What should I tell the family? What should I do? So that's the operational classification. So seizures. In our head, if we have to classify, you can say something that is focal onset or generalized onset, or it's okay to classify it as unknown onset. We are less likely to make mistakes if we do this, because we might have a confusion in our mind as to whether this is really epilepsy or not. And it is difficult to classify. Some things are difficult to classify. So those etiology wise, those that can be structural, you could have a lesion in the brain, you could have a hypoglycemic injury, or you could have a periventricular leukomalacia, such as, a, that, such as what gives rise to CP. You could have a child with a Down syndrome, or you could have lots of genetic defects. You could have a TB or a meningitis, which is causing things. Or you could have lots of metabolic abnormalities, which are rarer. So this is in order of what is common is what it is put. In our country, the commonest is structural followed by genetic followed by infectious. These three are very, very common, equally common. Then comes the less common ones, the metabolic, the immune, and the unknown, which is always going to be a big one. And they're going to be classified back there. So then that, those are the seizure types. Then the epilepsy types, again, you're calling it as focal generalized combined because there are patients with, so for example, you would get a child with a structural abnormality who will start off as a focal, but can spread to the rest of the brain. And it may look like a generalized epilepsy. Or the unknown again. Don't, do, do, don't be afraid to call something unknown or unknowing. Then comes the epilepsy syndrome. This is where you're crystallizing it and, and saying, okay, you are more sure that this is where it is heading, that this child's prognostication, you're more sure of it. Always, always remember that this is what is more important for the family, school morbidities. What are they doing in school? How is the social life being impaired, impacted? So generalized seizure that originates at some point within and rapidly engages bilaterally distributed networks within both hemispheres. So that is what we call by generalized seizures. They can include cortical or subcortical structures, but not necessarily, not the entire cortex, but in effect, it's the whole thing. So this is these are two examples of generalized. So then you have focal seizures. Focal seizures, they are 
seizures that originate within networks, meaning neuronal networks, that are limited to one hemisphere. They're not spreading to the opposite hemisphere. Occasionally they can spread. They're usually discrete and localized, but they can get a bit more spread widely. And occasionally they can spread, but there's always a time lag which you can get both in semiology, which is the description of the symptomatology that you're seeing, but also on EEG as well. So this is from the same paper, ILA's classification. It's again, I would not want you to get confused about all of this, but I would want those of you who are more interested to just think in your head. You, can, you should always ask your question, focal, analyzed, unknown. You can always classify it into that. If it's focal, is it motor? Is it non-motor? Meaning it need not always be jerking. Jerking is a physical phenomenon. It's a motor seizure. But you could have children. So we recently had a child who was looking at her hands and saying, my hand is going black. So she had a focal sensory seizure. Or you could look at look somewhere and say, uh, you know, uh, as she's seeing if it's an occipital seizure, that the child is actually, it's not visible from outside, but the child is seeing blue blobs or red blobs or something like that. So those are so occipital seizures, visual seizures. So you can have generalized onset seizures, which are tonic clonic. These are multiple, uh, multiple different types of seizures. So just giving an example. So for example, this is a seizure. It could be a seizure if it is originating in the brain, but it could be myoclonic if it is very quick, milli, my, uh, milliseconds. The same thing if it is one or two seconds, it is called an epileptic spasm. The same thing if it is more than, sorry, that's, that's a mistake. It's greater than two seconds, not less than two seconds. If it is more than two seconds, it's a tonic seizure. Sorry, if it's less than two seconds, it's an atonic one, and the tonic one is more than two seconds. But tonic and atonic are the same, except that the head is the head becomes very loose. So this is an example. This is a classical example of what is called a so that is an epileptic it spasm. Noisy. In a baby. Long. Okay. Just, it... In a child. In a baby who is if you can notice, it's repetitively it's sitting in the mother's lap, repetitively flexing the upper limbs forward. And if you, if you notice, the lower limbs are the, at flexed slightly at the hip, and it is very repetitive. So this is symptoms of West syndrome. So this is what is called as infantile spasm. This is the triad that we heard of. The baby is flexing itself, and then in the, you see the classical hypsrhythmia pattern, and then you see developmental regression, and there is developmental problems. But the problem is that so diseases don't read textbooks. So when by the time they come to us with this classical triad, it's already too late. They're already untreated, unrecognized hypsarrhythmia means the IQ of the child is dropping day by day. So you would have to check and, and pick it up very quickly. So the way to pick it up very quickly is noticing things. So I'm going to give you one example of a child we dealt with last month. So this is a four-day-old child who was in one of the medical colleges, was born there, term baby at 37 weeks had right upper limb jerky movements on day four. The story is that the child was, was two kgs at birth, was an uh, had uh, 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 IUGR, growth, intrauterine growth restriction. There was fetal distress, and so had a, was born by, was delivered by C-section, cried at birth, but at four hours, what was observed for four hours when it was absolutely fine. So the baby was shifted to the mother's side. But this is where, it, but then on day four, it presented with right upper, upper limb jerky movements, so an MRI brain was done, and this uh, the first is a, uh, the ultrasound, and it showed, as you can see on the right side, there is a there's a shadow there that looks like a bleed, and this is a CT. CT is not what not the uh, imaging of choice. So this is what belongs to that child. There's a right hemisphere. So this is the right side on the uh, this is the right side, and this is the left side. As you can see, white hyper intense areas, the white color thing that you're seeing on the, inside the right lateral ventricles. That is a bleed. And this is the same child. If you do an MR venogram, children don't, a term children do not simply bleed into their uh, ventricles. Usually if they have a bleed, there is usually intracranial bleed. There is usually a cause to it. And the commonest cause is a, cere a cerebral sinus venous thrombosis. There are, there are high risk factors for it. If the child, uh, usually cesarean, child is not fed, hyponatremia, these are all the high risk for it. So this baby was, was loaded with phenobarbital, the seizures immediately terminated. So then the neonatologists were very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, were, they were quite relaxed. So then they changed it to levetiracetam. The baby had no further seizures and the baby was discharged home. And about three to four months time, because the child was fine, they stopped the anti-epileptic drugs. Levetiracetam was stopped. So this is in the newborn period, the same child's left-sided jerk.
So the only thing is that by four or five months, when the child came for follow up, the ch the parents were very happy that they said, "Oh, the child is so good. The child is showing some preference, reaching out for things with right hand." This should be an alarm bell for us. You should not have early handedness. Early handedness is always a sign that there is a cerebral palsy or there is a neurological deficit. Something has happened. Then came following that, which was not picked up, came paroxysmal events. So this was a video that was recently sent by the family. They thought the child is playing. So this is recently, the last few days, if you can notice, she's just lifting her legs up, leaving it down, and then stopping. She's still playful. This too is West syndrome, the same child. So it looks like play, but it is repetitive, and the family picked up on it. It's very subtle. She's turning to one side. She's feeding. It's the context in which this baby is having it. This baby hasn't had an opportunity to develop it as floridly as the previous baby. So this baby is very early. It's an early pickup. But the, but one of the take-home lessons is that this baby had a stroke. When the baby had a stroke, this is the same baby whose MRI that we've seen. If the baby had a stroke, we would know that at two years of age, at two years of age, you would be, you, until two years of age, you're at a risk of developing this thing called as West syndrome, which is an epileptic encephalopathy. So this is what the EG would look like for hips arrhythmia. So this is a printout of one of the EGs. This, ba this is not this baby's EG, but one of the EGs of one of our patients with hips arrhythmia. So these are some of the other videos of other patients of ours. If you see, now this is again a baby with a polymicrogyria. So if you see the paroxysmal event, they are asymmetrical. You look what she's doing with the right hand and right leg. It's asymmetrical because her brain lesion is asymmetrical. So hips arrhythmia can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. It can be flexor or extensor. And this is another infant who's got asymmetrical. The common one that you get is a, is a symmetrical one, but most of these that are these two are common, but they are often missed. And by the time there's a why why I'm showing these videos so often is because the, again you're concentrating on seizure focal, uh, seizure tyride. the focal and the, and the there is about fifty percent mortality to many of these children. If we pick them up on time, then we can do something about it. So TS is one of the one of the syndromes that you can think about. So for if you take tuberous sclerosis. They have a structural problem. They have a genetic disease. The genetic basis, glucose transporter deficiency is another such disease where there is a genetic basis and there is a metabolic abnormality in that glucose is not transferred to the brain. So I'm just using TS as a poem of TS. And asteroids hit a green tree and burnt its leaves. So that is astro astrocytomas. Green tree is a chagrin path. So there is ashes is ash leaf macules. Brain is disabled because they're going to be mentally disabled, mentally de retarded because of that. Cognitive ability. Heart is full of rhabdomyoma. Angels, they have, they have, they are, and everything is fake. Fake amitosis. They have no sebum, is that? Uh, they have um, adenoma sebaceum. So seizures got me, that is seizures. Armatin and tuberin are the genes that are involved. Mom and I have failed me because it is autosomal recess, uh, dominant gene, dominant inheritance. And please, God, help me. It's a difficult disease. So these are some of the things that are seen in tuberous sclerosis. Multi-organ involvement that we learned in pathology, the Ashley's macules, the multiple submental nodules, the tubers, the giant cell astrocytomas, the seegers. This is ultimately the cause of death is the lymphangiomatosis in the lungs, the angiomyolipoma in the liver, in the in the in the kidney, and this is the heart that is full of rhabdomyoma, and the astrocytoma in the retina, and this is subangual fibroma, and these are the pits. So this is not so uncommon. One in 6,000 people have it. So you would have come across them. So this is some diagnostic criteria, but there's always help for that. So an eight-month-old baby with a normal developmental history, paroxysmal episode for the last few weeks. This is what this baby looks like. So on the surface, this one also looks like the spasm. The difference is developmental history is normal. The difference there is in that child, we had an abnormal developmental history. So everything is in context. This was absolutely fine. This is a non-epileptic seizure mimic. This is another child whose brain has who's again doing something, face is going red, but this is a self-gratification, infant self-gratification. 
So it's important to recognize that it is all about context. So here, this is again a developmentally normal child who's bored. What is the context of doing it? Infantile spasms usually come and it is unpredictable. It comes when they're waking up from sleep or going into sleep. These are children who are sitting and getting bored, who are who have a lot of ability and who, if you, who it is possible to distract them from the event, whereas spasms are not distractible. So a five-year-old child, the parents noticed staring episodes, which her teacher noticed. They felt they were not frequent. But her academic performance had worsened over the last six months. She was neurodevelopmentally normal. So this is a video that was taken. We are doing a hyperventilation. And as you, if you notice, I've just fast forwarded the video a little bit. She's hyperventilating for a few seconds. Now that's an event. So that's, she's still hyperventilating, not yet. That's an, uh, that's an event. So that's the event. That automatism is her, she's unaware of what she's doing. She's just rubbing her nose and she's done. That's a behavioral arrest. So that's an abs on seizure. So that's not a focal seizure. That's not a partial seizure. Now she's back to normal. So usually it lasts only 20, 30 seconds. So we got that only at almost, uh, almost two minutes of hyperventilation. So that is a typical childhood absence epilepsy. So febrile seizures, the commonest type of epileptic seizures in children, usually benign, nothing to be worried about. These children mostly do not develop epilepsy, but they have a higher risk of epilepsy than children with ep uh, than normal children who do not have febrile seizures. Some of the features are always associated with fever, neurodevelopmentally normal child. What I would want you to take away from this, again, concept is, there is a concept of when a child, febrile seizures happen between Various textbooks tell us it's six months, six years to six months, six months to six years, or five months to five years. Doesn't matter. It doesn't happen younger than five months. But whatever it is, at that time, you can get febrile seizures, but you can also get children with cerebral palsy and other actual diseases who are hiding. They may have had a fever, fever, which is triggering seizures. So remember, there are two of these things: either a lamb or a wolf in lamb's lamb's clothing. So you could have a febrile seizure versus fever triggered seizure. So it's up to us to tease it out and say, whom do you have to worry about? Whom do you have to reassure? So overall risk of febrile seizures for anybody with one-time seizure is 30%. So the earlier the age of onset, the higher the risk of recurrence. A family history of febrile seizure means there's a higher risk of seizure. If they are getting seizure, fever, seizure at lower temperatures, uh, then it is, then they have a higher risk as well. So these are some of the risk factors. So the risk factors is, if there's no risk factor, about risk of recurrence is 15%. If one risk factor is there, 27. So like that, there is a cumulative risk. The more risk factor they carry, the higher the risk of recurrence. But if you're very clear, you're always going to classify in your mind, is it febrile seizure or is it fever triggered seizure? But if in your mind, you're very clear, this is febrile seizure, then you can confidently tell the family, don't do anything. It doesn't matter if you get the seizure once, febrile seizure once, or you get it 20 times, it is not going to affect the development of the child. Bearing in mind that anti epileptic drugs carry a risk of um, of cognition and memory and other things. So this is a two-year-old child who was brought into the ER with a fever and seizure for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So the temperature at home was 37.5 degrees at that time. But mother said there was history of fever before. She had given paracetamol and meftal, mefenamic acid. She was being tepid sponged. And then she had a seizure. So one of the things I wanted to ask is that, I wanted to highlight is tepid sponging for children with febrile seizure is not an advisable thing. Seizures usually happen when that's, when your fever core temperature is rising. When you tepid sponge somebody aggressively, peripheral temperature goes down and core temperature goes up. And that is when many times seizures occur. So try and, in those children with febrile seizure, try and avoid tepid sponging. So there is a family history of maternal febrile seizure and epilepsy in grandmother. So is this simple epilepsy, uh, febrile seizure or complex? So simple the reason why this is put is because there's only 37.5 degrees so the temperature is not core temperature it's a peripheral temperature and so you're allowed to have fever until two hours after having the seizure because that much time it may take for it to appear peripherally and the fever and the 15 15 minutes up to 10 to 15 minutes is still considered typical 
So some things on investigations, neuroimaging, some basics. There are structural imaging is ultrasound, CT, MRI, functional is MR spectroscopy and mega inspect. EG in children and neonates, something on, sometimes if you're worried about uh, meningitis and infections, we might do infectious meta diseases workup, metabolic workup. So some children have glucose transporter deficiency and other metabolic diseases. So we might have to check for that. Autoimmune workup because autoimmune can also present as, uh, as epilepsy and many times genetic studies nowadays. So what are the guidelines? Some important guidelines for neuroimaging. Any child under two years deserves, has earned itself neuroimaging if they have presented with epilepsy. If they have focal epilepsy, everybody deserves uh, neuroimaging. If you've given a simple medication and the medicine is not working, then you need to think, go back and check our premises. Others are, in, if you have idiopathic generalized epilepsy and it is not fitting into a syndrome and we're scratching our head, then we need to start thinking, we need to go look again, start again from scratch. If there are other issues like psychiatric problems, cognitive problems. So the seven-year-old boy, Developmentally no, delayed and speech delayed, has unremarkable birth history. Difficult, he's developed epilepsy that is difficult to treat. And if, as you can see, the MRI brain is completely normal. But MR spectroscopy, this is one of the functional studies, it shows that his creatine peak is very low. This is just giving an example of a, of, of a, of a disease, which is very important. Because if you give these children creatine su supplement, they normalize. You can prevent mental retardation and treat the epilepsy. So I'm not going into the details of EEG, but I'm just going to mention something that don't be scared of EEGs. Always remember it's only about pattern recognition. So here are all birds, and this is the only bird that isn't that's not really a bird. So it's all about asking the right question to, uh, to get the right answer. But and also remember, most of the times EEGs are used improperly. We don't use forks to drink soup, but you can modify that fork and make it fit it into something else and then drink something. So 50% of short EEGs in those with epilepsy will be negative. And, and normal individuals will, 5% of normal individuals will have EEG that is positive, a false positive. So that is a false positive. And the yield of the EEG is increased by sleep and hyperventilation and photic stimulation. To summarize, paroxysmal events. So I'm calling, so whenever we are not sure if it's an event, a seizure, <coughs> Is epileptic or non-epileptic, call them paroxysmal events. So paroxysmal events are common in childhood and cause a lot of anxiety. They may or may not be epileptic in nature. The ILA, the International League Against Epilepsy, has this five-axis system that's a good guide in handling all the aspects of these events. Epilepsy in childhood has a different and unique aspect, the developmental price, the young brain. The, hence, I had emphasized so much on West syndrome because the same EEG, which is very bad, epileptic encephalopathy, at nine, nine years, nine months means different. To, you treat it very aggressively, whereas at two years, you wouldn't treat it as aggressively. And at 10 years, you would treat it less, less aggressively, absolutely, because that brain does not pay the same price. You have less mental retardation as a consequence. So the, there is a concept, a concept of developmental epilepsy. Most epilepsies are treatable. We have reason for hope. On rare occasions, referral to specialists are needed, but early referrals result in better outcomes. So that's it. I, I was told that uh, developmental thing is the next, uh, you, you, if you have questions. So I just put this poster to get you all to think that development is a trajectory, but so it's not just numbers and ranges. It's the same child when you're following up, there should be, there's a sequence uh, of development. If, you're, if you have any doubts about any of those things, then you have to think, why is this child not following the trajectory? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for that wonderful talk. I think we were also fortunate to uh, see that we were able to beat the technical paroxysmal glitches that happened before the talk, uh, where the internet, the computers were probably having a seizure, but during the presentation, we were able to see the wonderful videos as such. Uh, before I come to the interactive discussion as such, I'd like to invite our president of the St. John's Medical College Alumni Association, Dr. Anthony Robert, to say a few words to the gathering to kickstart the day two of the virtual CME as such. Dr. Robert. Uh, Dr. Robert, you're on mute. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you, Nitin. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anne. For those of you who don't know her, she's doing exemplary work and raises a lot of money and impacts a lot of children and doing it all in a very, very own quiet style. I'm so proud that she was here today to, to reach our students. And I'm going to implore her to join Nitin 
because we want to have continuing support to our doctors who are in the rural area on a virtual platform. So if you are able to help us virtually on the, through, through, through a WhatsApp group which Nitin and uh, Gina Joy have created to help with simple queries from the villages, it will be very useful. Having said that, uh, good morning everyone who's logged in. I'm so happy that this program is, is, is reaching out and it's so active. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to my team, especially the man you're seeing there, Nitin, Tridvi, who you're not seeing. And of course, George. George is in the background, but George is making sure that, that everything is going on beautifully. We should see you at some point on the screen. Okay, have, have, have a great second. No, I don't think we need to. <laughs> no, 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 not in the current situation where George is in his room. <laughs> Right. Uh, so, Dr. Anne, we had uh, one question, and that was essentially, when should we, when should the doctors in rural service refer a patient with seizures, and when is it okay to manage in their own center? So, majority of the time, so majority of the time, this, uh, maybe 70, 80 percent of the time, they should be managed. 60 percent of the time, a general practitioner can manage. If the people in rural services, they, they can increase their, um, what do you call it, efficacy or efficiency by attending some, there are some, there are some lot of resources available. Things like, so for example, there's something called a pediatric epilepsy training day. Um, sorry, I'm not selling the concept because I'm the national coordinator for that. But that is just like uh, NLS and APLS. So this is an international course, which is done in conjunction with the International League Against Epilepsy and run by the BPNA. And it's a one day course. And it sort of helps people. It's meant for doctors and nurses that they can handle epilepsy so that the, if you have 2% of the population who have epilepsy, you cannot, your specialists cannot cope with them. True. Most of the people are not going to be able to reach, reach the places. And, and they do not need to also. Majority, 60% of epilepsy is going to be absolutely fine. 80% of them with a little bit of help, our doctors in the rural area can do great. And even if they have, they need specialist help, even then it would be a hub and spoke model. They would be referred and referred back and it would be, be shared care. No, I, I think it's wonderful that you mentioned about the Pediatric National Epilepsy Day training program. And I think that is what most of the rural doctors were also looking forward. Uh, we will link you up and we will disseminate the uh, sort of more details and logistics and how and how they can avail that service. The next thing that comes is when should a patient who has had seizure be called next for a follow up? So that's the thing. And that's why I put those diverse videos saying that what looks so like the, the pediatrician thought it was not a seizure was actually a very serious seizure. So this is where everything in epilepsy is about context, context and context, location, location and location, just like site value. So you're going to say, when did it happen? How did it happen? You may have a seizure that looks really bad and disturbing and the child has had status. And I'll tell you from my mistakes. I had a, a child with known epilepsy who was on two anti-epileptics. She came in. She was from a rural area from Chikmagalur. They came in and she was seven years of age. She was otherwise developmentally fine. And she, she came in in status. And so obviously I was called. PG had given medication. And um, we, were, we, we administered lorazepam, everything. We loaded her on phenorphenitoin, nothing was happening. And then I, I just stepped back and said, wait, wait a second, what's happening? She's having a seizure, which is a generalized tonic clonic seizure for such a long time. And there is no change in her vitals. Then it tweaked that it is a pseudo seizure. She's a child with an epilepsy who had a pseudo seizure. So when we dug down a little bit more, I understood she was being sexually abused by her grandfather. And she didn't want to go home. So... We get fooled so all the time. Said, a lot of history taking and looking at those subtle things uh, really matter and setting the context as you. This is, this is why the Pediatric Epilepsy Training Day matters because in India, we have conducted 50 courses. Oh. 50 of these courses, these are one day courses. We've trained nearly 2000 pediatricians all over India. Oh. So this is done all over the world. So this is so uh, this th course came into being because one doctor in the UK was sent to jail had a case filed because he, he had, when they looked at his 10 year service, almost 600 patients, he had over diagnosed with epilepsy and given them unnecessary anti-epileptics. This is, you can't diagnose, you can't detect how many he, he missed. Misdiagnosis is left. So then they found out that 20% is allowed for pediatrician, but you can't have 30%. True. So true. majority of time you can. And, yeah, and then, you so what happened? 
when you audited it, when they audited what they found is that 10 years of, P, uh, uh, you know, like APLS and NALS, 10 years of training everybody, making it mandatory for everybody, reduced the incidence of epilepsy in UK. Not because epilepsy came down, or overdiagnosis came down. And they were able to manage. All right. So we have three questions coming in. And the first question is this. How to differentiate psychosis from true seizures, I'm assuming, uh, by history as such? Yeah, it would be history. You'll be just digging, uh, you know, allow your gut to go. When we uh, Usually what happens is that when we are not as experienced, it's okay to not be as experienced because we all start somewhere. Just keep your mind open and go with what our, our teachers told us. Open-ended questions to close-ended questions. Start off, let them go, their body language speaks, and then keep asking, is there any secondary gain? What was the situation where the seizure happened? Did, the, did any outcome come for what the child benefited? I mean, what the child didn't want to happen. So, for example, if it happened in school, a seizure that happens only in school is not necessarily a seizure. You can't have that. Was the child taken away from a situation where it did not want to, want to be there? What was the other question, Dr. Nitin? Should a four-year-old with persistent yawning for 15 minutes be considered? So, again, persistent yawning... It could be. So this is where when you have doubts, it's okay to have doubts. Uh, as I've said, I've myself been fooled so many times that never say never, no in life. Go back. When we have questions, our first and basic tool is our history and the training we got. We just go and ask again and again. And you take the entire birth history. Then you then you ask, has there been an academic decline? So, so for example, before you get a regression in a very small child, the first thing you get is not regression. By the time it's already late, you'll get saying that the child is less active or not smiling as much, not visually as active, uh, attentive. A four-year-old is a child who developmentally will be playing with children, will be going to school, will be learning things. But if you think he's not, his grasping capacity has come down. But again, that's a very subtle sign. And if you're worried about it, and if you think there is a past history or a birth history or something of note, then you should probably investigate. If not, you can reassure. But sometimes if you don't have resources, the other way of doing it is by saying, okay, come back in two months and then take the history again. You're basically making sure that that is also, that is surveillance and that is part of investigation. Right. And the last question is, is prophylaxis required for a child with previous history of multiple febrile seizures? So thank you for that question. That is a very, very important question. No, prophylaxis is not important. So this is where that um, um, there is only one paper from CMC Valor that says that prophylaxis is done. Nowhere in the world is prophylaxis given. It's done only in India. You have to classify febrile seizure versus fever-triggered seizure. If you think it is fever-triggered seizure, then you need to give medication. Because then the diagnosis is epilepsy, it is not febrile seizure. If you are sure somebody has febrile seizure, it does not matter. So when we used to do these courses of talking to doctors, we used to go to you know peripheral settings to talk to them. Uh, one of our faculty was a pediatric neurologist who had febrile seizures himself. And we would show him as an example and say, look, he's fine. So prophylaxis is absolutely not necessary. But keep your mind open every time. If a child is having very frequent febrile seizures, it could be a genetic defect such as Dravet syndrome, SCN, SCN1A or any of, the, any of the channelopathies or a genetic epilepsy or something else. So then again, go back to your history. Before you reassure them, go back to your history. But once you know very well, Typical features. Typical features are there less than 10 minutes. Less, they're, they're never focal. For febrile seizures, that are classical febrile seizures are generalized. If they're focal, your alarm bell should ring. In one febrile event, you should not have more than one event. And you should not have without fever. If all of these criteria are suited, then please be assured. And developmentally normal child, you can completely reassure the child, uh, parents, that between six years to six months, they are going to outgrow it. And tell them, no prophylaxis. But at any point, if... You are worried, then you investigate them. You don't unnecessarily treat them. Do not give them freesium. Do not give them phenytoin. You can give them phenytoin and prevent seizures. But remember, you are inflicting cognitive damage. So don't do it. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ang, for that wonderful talk. And uh, really appreciate and a topic which is the need of the hour in the rural setting, especially among people who see 
uh, pediatric and children cases and beautifully brought out and definitely we uh, there are a lot of uh, rural doctors who are messaging interest in the pediatric national epilepsy day training program and we will put them in touch across to you so from pediatrics uh, we move to obstetrics and from dr and we move to dr Anama, uh, uh, no introduction needed uh, for not only Johnites, but people across the country. Uh, she's the former HOD and the professor of the Department of OBG at St. John's Medical College. Uh, someone who has guided a lot of sister doctors also across the country uh, when there is um, a lot of sister doctors across the country uh, when there has been uh, trouble in high risk obstetric cases. And no better person than uh, Dr. Anama today to talk about approach to high-risk pregnancy. What is high-risk pregnancy and how you manage high-risk obstetrics in the rural setup? Uh, Dr. Anama, if you could unmute yourself. Uh, George, if you can unmute uh, Dr. Anama. Yeah. Uh, you're still not unmuted, uh, ma'am. We, we can hear you. Uh, if yeah, you yeah. Slide, yeah. So I think uh, what you need to do is, can you click on present? Yeah, I just, I'm just doing that. No, no, no. Just click on present and click on slides. And then you can just add file from your computer. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, all set to go. How do you move on? Oh, that's it. Okay, just press this. Okay, thank you, Nitin, for those uh, very kind words, but I don't think I deserve all that uh, praise and all that thing. We're just doing our work in St. John's, that's all. And um, thank you, alumni, and each one of you for having uh, asked us to do this. And uh, we feel it's quite a proud privilege to help people working in the rural setup, but I don't know whether this is meant really for the rural setup or not. So I just thought I would just share a few thoughts with you on what what is high risk pregnancy. Uh, high risk pregnancy is a condition that jeopardizes the mother, the fetus or both. It's a condition which arises from pregnancy itself, or it may be a condition which is pregnant, present before pregnancy and is resulting in higher morbidity and mortality to both the mother and the baby. And Hence, the risk assessment should start with our first visit when she comes to the antenatal clinic, but it should be ongoing throughout pregnancy as well. So just to go through what are some of these, it may be, like I said, complications arising from pregnancy, okay, which I just put up, or it can be other uh, conditions associated with pregnancy, like medical conditions, like we were just discussing epilepsy, we're discussing uh, thrombos I mean, or thrombocytopenia, it can be diabetes, it can be hypertension, other medical disorders which are coexistent with pregnancy. So just to go over, I'm going to just discuss with you four or five of these complications, some which I thought were important because I can't go through the whole of high-risk pregnancy because the list is too long, which is why I didn't put up the big list. So I'm just going to do a few that is bleeding in pregnancy, antepartum and postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, when you come to bleeding, any bleeding, why is bleeding so important in pregnancy? Because any bleeding is a medical emergency. Maternal blood loss decreases the oxygen carrying capacity, increasing the risk of hypovolemia, anemia, infection, preterm labor and preterm birth in that order. And it also adversely affects the oxygen delivery to the fetus because the fetus is directly dependent on the mother for its oxygen supply. The fetal risks include, because of blood loss, includes anemia, hypoxemia, hypoxia, anoxia, and preterm birth. So it's important for us to think about this in pregnancy. So there can be some bleeding disorders associated with early, early preg um, bleeding during early pregnancy, which I think is easy, we can handle, except for ectopic pregnancy, where you need surgery. Others are handled, but then not to say much because I've seen an abortion, spontaneous abortion, we think, oh, bleeding is not much. Well, we just do an evacuation and, uh, you know, nothing happens. But I've seen people who abort, especially now when people are giving medical termination of, uh, we're doing medical termination with tablets with mefipristone and misoprostol. We find bleeding occurs so much at home and we underestimate the blood loss when the patient comes to the hospital. And patient is in so much of shock that patient needs to go to the ICU for 
further care and you know correction of her blood loss the next is uh, the most important that we deal with is uh, bleeding associated with late pregnancy that is the two major uh, killers that is placenta previa and abruptus placentae the most important thing in this is diagnosis the patient comes with bleeding we were taught that you know we have to treat the patient you know be very careful don't do pvs examine the patient our clinical diagnosis is the gold standard yes it is but now we have ultrasound with us and because ultrasound is there in early ultra you can look at an early ultrasound showing the placenta is low lying or placenta is covering the os or in addition to that we may have history from the patient of you know recurrent small bleeds which are you know painless or the patient can have some precipitating factor like coitus or something which will give us a clue that this could be placenta previa why i'm saying this is because placenta previa is a condition which affects the mother first very drastically before the fetus is affected because the bleeding is in small warning hemorrhages followed by a heavy bout of bleeding which when necessitates necessitates uh, operative delivery but as abruptio placentae small bleeds or large bleeds collecting behind the placenta and you're not aware of it okay so your clinical diagnosis at this point is very important any preterm labor like patient comes with pain so you may think it's preterm labor but please think that if this could be abruption because if there's a bleed it's collecting the uterus is more than the period of gestation you're finding that it's hard and the most seriously affected of this is the fetus the fetus is first affected the mother is affected late if you neglect it so remember in abruptio placentae it's a mother who's affected late but it's a fetus and you lose the fetus and people who've had massive abruption please be careful in the subsequent pregnancy handle with care admit the patient keep her in the hospital and sometimes even in the hospital sometimes you cannot do some anything because suddenly the patient starts abrupting and the placenta just completely separates and you've lost the baby immediately so you do if you've not intervened we recently last week we had a case in st johns where the patient had a massive abruption in the previous pregnancy at 34 weeks of gestation so she was admitted this time at 32 weeks of gestation and she was kept in the ward suddenly she started bleeding and complained of a little pain by the time they took her to the theater the whole placenta had separated so it's very very um, tricky situation where you have to be very careful and monitor the patient keep her in the hospital and you should be having 24 hours cesarean section facilities if you are keeping such a patient with you a few words on placenta previa one is i just want to say if at the time when you are doing cesarean section if you are taking up a patient with placenta previa especially with our increased cesarean section rates please remember that can be an adherent placenta so if the placenta is adherent at, when you're doing a cesarean section because it's very really thinned out and if it's an anterior wall placenta it could invade through and enter into the bladder so even doing a cesarean hysterectomy at that time is a difficult proposition and secondly when the placenta is adherent at any situation please don't try and remove the placenta piecemeal if you feel the placenta is adherent just cut close to the base leave the placenta in situ give the patient methotrexate and then follow up weekly and you can save that uterus okay so this is something that we have done time and again and it can be done to help the patient to have a next pregnancy coming to postpartum uh, hemorrhage i can't overemphasize the fact that we underestimate blood loss during delivery we know that 500 ml of blood loss in normal delivery and 1000 in cesarean is okay but the episiotomy can bleed quite a bit because by the time we deliver given episiotomy deliver there's a lot of bleeding happening similarly when section is happening the angles are bleeding you're taking out the baby now we are doing delayed cord clamping and then we're waiting for the pediatrician to take the uh, baby there is a lot of blood loss so remember when there's postpartum hemorrhage early referral before the patient has lost too much of blood and gone into dic why am i saying this because once the patient has gone into dic even transfusing and correcting the dic takes a long time and even if we do a hysterectomy sometimes the patient continues to bleed so the morbidity to the patient is very high unless you do early referral so how to pre prevent this is anticipation anticipation of pph doing active management of third stage of labor by which immediately after delivering now we are doing delayed cord clamping so after that you can administer oxytocin and then followed by uh, controlled cord traction and uterine massage which are the components of your amt sl the next is we have in armamentarium a lot of uterotonics but the newest we have oxytocin we have um, uh, carbiprost we have methogen but remember the most the newer one the safer one and the one which is a heat stable Uh, drug which we are using very commonly now is carbitocin 
Carbitocin, 100 milligram given IV or IM is a safer option and it reduces the need for other oxytocin. So we don't have to combine too many if we use this. So either during cesarean section or in any of your high risk pregnancies, remember it's there, you can use it. If you're in a peripheral center, you want to refer the patient, patient is bleeding. So the most important thing is first you should identify whether it's you know, vaginal delivery, whether it's traumatic or whether it is atonic PPH. If it is traumatic PPH, you can do vaginal packing and send the patient. If it is atonic, either balloon tapenoid, you can put in a condom catheter, or there is a suction cannula, a simple suction cannula, which you can put inside, and or there's a uterine, uh, Pili has made a uterine clamp, which you can insert vaginally, just to control the bleeding and the patient can be referred. If you have facilities for cesarean section operative procedures, you can do a laparotomy, put your B-Lynch sutures, or you can put global sutures all around, where your sutures are described, which you can use, or you can do a simple uterine artery ligation. Anybody can learn to do this uterine artery ligation. It's very simple. You push the bladder down, and then you just have to clamp the, and you just have to ligate the uterine artery. If you have facilities, obstetric hysterectomy, if you're, if you're doing uh, abdominal hysterectomy, surely you can do an obstetric hysterectomy. You don't have to really remove the cervix, so you don't have to really go down. If you can, you can do it if it's simple, or just remove at the level of the, you clamp the uterines, remove it, leave the cervix behind if you can't identify it, and close the vault and come. Internal iliac ligation, um, most gynecology people are teaching people to do internal iliac. If, you have, if you're trained in it, you can. If not, that's fine. So postpartum hemorrhage, early referral, anticipate early referral, and then do what you want before you send, do what you can before you send the patient. Next, coming to the next topic, which is jaundice in pregnancy. Just wanted to know, just, just wanted to tell you that many people get uh, these kind of patients, which you uh, which are referred to us from the peripheral centers. And we find that, you know, a uh, patient comes to us as a late referral. Remember when a patient has, when you find a patient coming with, the jaundice in pregnancy, there can be pre-existing liver disease in the patient. It can be something which is coincidental with pregnancy, or it can be something which is unique to pregnancy. The ones which are unique to pregnancy are the ones which we are most often concerned with. And remember, the ones which are the most dangerous is one is HELP syndrome and the other is AFLP or acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Now, what is this acute fatty liver of pregnancy? It is a condition where we find that the patient comes with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, but the most distinguishing feature is encephalopathy. The patient is drowsy and patient is deeply jaundiced. And you can find that, you know, patient has a flap, may or may not have a flap. So when you find that the patient is kind of sick, then you think of it. Plus, patient, when you examine the patient, what are the features? The bilirubin will be quite high. The patient will be in profound hypoglycemia. So every time the patient will, when you check her uh, sugars, sugars will be less than 60, less than 50. And when you do the total count, the total count is very high. Normally, the count is a little on the borderline in uh, pregnancy. But in, in this condition, we found counts as high as 72,000, you know, 50,000, 60,000. The count will be very high. The liver enzymes, AST, ALT is not very high. And uh, patient also has uh, creatinine, which will be high. But the most important thing is, in addition to bilirubin being high, hypoglycemia, encephalopathy, coagulopathy is the hallmark. The PT, APTT will be prolonged and the patient will be bleeding from all sides. If you have facilities to do an ammonia, you can do it just to clinch the diagnosis. If you don't do it also, it's okay. But remember, your coagulopathy is important. Renal function is important. Your liver function is important. And your sugars are important. This kind of tells you that this is AFLP. Okay, you may or may not have facilities. Now, why is this so important? Ultrasound fe features are not very important. Why is it very important? Because you have to differentiate it from some other conditions. One is intrahepatic cholestasis and the other is health. Now, how do you differentiate it from, um, how do you differentiate this condition from health? See, in health, if you look, the coagulopathy is not so much. The coagulopathy is much, much less. You find that, you know, her platelets are low, but her PT, APTT is normal. Whereas in um, AFLP, you find the platelet is normal, but the PT, APTT is prolonged. The renal function test, renal uh, compromise will be there in both. In liver enzymes also won't be very much raised in both. But hypoglycemia is not a hallmark of health. Okay, And bilirubin won't be very high in health. Bilirubin will be normal or less than normal. But in 
uh, and there'll be no features of encephalopathy. Now, why do we have to differentiate it from health? Because some patients or both patients present with same clinical features, and but in both the treatment of choice is termination of pregnancy. But remember, in AFLP, you have to correct the coagulopathy before you terminate the pregnancy. If you don't do that, what happens? The patient starts bleeding. You may do a cesarean, take out the baby, but the patient keeps bleeding and the uterus will not contract. And then you are landing, landing up with doing an obstetric hysterectomy. And even after hysterectomy, the patient continues to bleed from all kinds of sites and you may lose the patient. So it is very, very important for you to differentiate which of the conditions it is, correct the coagulopathy, and then take the patient up. For both, termination of pregnancy is important. We next come to intrahepatic cholestasis, which is another condition which, are, uh, which causes jaundice in pregnancy. Here, the patient, this is a condition where uh, there is accumulation of bile acids in the mother. And why? It's because of the pregnancy hormones. These cross over to the baby and it's toxic to the heart of the baby. It causes the baby to pass meconium. So there's fetal distress. So it's it, the mother has a very quiet um, antenatal period except for profound itching. Okay, so mother comes with itching of the palms and soles and that's all that the mother has. And mother run, it's a very um, quiet period for the mother other, other than this distressing itching. But the baby, it's a very dangerous situation where because you don't know, suddenly you can have an intrauterine and fetal death because of arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmia. And it usually occurs in the third trimester. So we need to know about it because if we know about it, uh, we can advise the patient, we can start treatment, reduce the bile acids and monitor the fetus carefully and take the patient and take the baby out at term. So if a patient comes with jaundice, what all should we do? We should take history of any use of oral on uh, any drugs, any drug history, uh, any close family history of obstetric cholestasis, color of the urine, stools, you know, check the BP because we don't know whether it's because of help or not. Look for any associated rash. See, if there's an associated rash, it could be something else. It need not be um, cholestasis of pregnancy. It could be pruritus of pregnancy. Okay, and investigations, remember... Another thing which can you can have encephalopathy is viral hepatitis, it is especially hepatitis E. We find hepatitis E very closely linked to, I mean, quite similar, which has similar features as um, AFLP. So you have to do a viral screen also to make sure it's not that. Then do send your liver function. Please look for bile acids. Sometimes in obstetric cholestasis, the liver function may be normal, but bile acids will be high. Most important is fetal monitoring, that is CTG. CTG has to be done very frequently. You can do it twice a week. If you have facilities every day, very good, do it. You can, because of the itching, the patient's complaining of severe itching, you need to have some, you know, topical uh, emollients like, you know, we give them um, uh, caladral lotion and you can give them an antihistamine as well. Uh, recall within 24 to 40 if you find the bile acids are abnormal. Why? Because then you need to start her on um, treatment, specific treatment for the same. Remember, these patients need to be delivered early. Delivery is preferably by 37 weeks. You can induce labor. There's no need. Earlier, the teaching was we had to do cesarean, but we need not do cesarean. We need to monitor the fetus and take the baby out at the appropriate time. Post In, in the patient in pregnancy, we need to explain to the patient okay, the condition deliver her early by 37 weeks, and then explain the risk of maternal liver damage either in the long or short term uh, condition that can uh, occur. And pruritus will resolve after delivery. But remember, you have to do her liver function a little later, maybe within four to six weeks and make sure it comes back to normal. Postnatal discharge, when you discharge the patient, remember, discuss contraception. Tell her to avoid contra uh, oral contraceptives because oral contraceptives, again, can cause cholestasis subsequently. And the risk of recurrence in subsequent pregnancies is 40 to 90%. And tell her that it doesn't affect her baby. The next is cardiac disease in pregnancy. We finished jaundice, we finished bleeding in pregnancy. Now we come to cardiac disease. Now, see, cardiac disease, earlier days, we were only looking at rheumatic heart disease because congenital heart disease was not a big thing. It was just ASD, VSD, and that was not a major problem at all. But now we're finding with so many congenital heart disease children, 
being treated and uh, repairs being done and for multiple you know complex diseases of the heart we are finding that many of them are becoming pregnant so the scenario has changed so now when the patient comes for pre pregnancy counseling you need to find out whether she's congenital heart disease whether she's rheumatic heart disease and you need to have a team of a cardiologist and you discussing with the patient and the genetics discussing with the patient regarding what are the genetics of uh, risks to the fetus as well so first thing you have to evaluate her new york heart status you need to see which nyha classification she falls into and you need to tell her about how what the scenario is going to be in pregnancy and how she's going to do this this is all very well for us to talk about but remember most of us see the patient when they come during pregnancy when they come during pregnancy with breathlessness and when we examine them this is the state where most of us see the patient when we see them here remember we need to refer to a cardiologist if you have the facility if you don't you have to see whatever she has you can discuss on the phone with a the cardiologist these are her situation these are her con- problems and this is a situation she is in failure remember failure occurs mainly by around after 32 weeks and so you need to discuss with the cardiologist what has to be done they may be on drugs already they may be on you know beta blockers they may be on you know usually now digital is digoxin is not given they basically on a beta blocker usually and they are usually on a on um, hydrochlorothiazide so basically this all usually the cardiologists usually give them and that is uh, explain to the mother the risk in pregnancy if possible refer her to a higher center i don't think we should uh, deal with this card because any time they can decompensate but if they refuse okay then you have to monitor them carefully okay keep them in the hospital preferably if you can't send them home and call them back at weekly visits and look for signs of failure or decompensation meanwhile remember fetal monitoring is just as important because they all land up with intrauterine growth restriction planning delivery when you're thinking of vaginal birth very versus cesarean section remember vaginal delivery is the safest for them as against cesarean section when when would you it's better that they go spontaneously into labor but induction is not an absolute contraindication though prostaglandins are relatively contraindicated in labor but we do give prostaglandin gel e2 gel it can be used carefully uh, and monitor the patient closely in labor make sure she's propped up she is you know on oxygen and when she reaches second stage when she is bearing down you know don't let her strain too much but um, we were taught you should use prophylactic forceps when patient has cardiac disease but remember one is cardiac patient goes into labor by herself very uh, quickly she progresses very fast and she delivers very fast so you don't have to wait with the forceps before you know the patient pushes but most people do that it's not necessary you have to use it only if she's straining too much because even that forceps is a little traumatic for the patient and then suturing that episiotomy is very difficult so as far as possible let her deliver comfortably quickly you know without much uh, straining post delivery keep immediately with you lasix because that's the time in the patient that's the mac time in the cardiac output was maximum and so remember patient will decompensate and please check for lung creps and give her uh, lasix avoid methogen if you need to give carbitocin is there now we usually give carbitocin and patient as well it can be given iim you don't have to give a direct iv then remember post delivery close monitoring um discuss contraception and advise him not to uh, get pregnant too fast the next is multiple pregnancy is another high risk pregnancy where patient comes in early preg now we have uh, assisted reproductive techniques so most of you would be dealing with you know higher order pregnancies like you know twins triplets okay remember they need ab- like adequate nutrition prevent anemia more frequent visits what is this more frequent antenatal visits depends on the co- assessing the chorionicity whether it's a monochorionic or whether it's a dichorionic pregnancy if it's a dichorionic pregnancy remember you can you need to monitor the patient a little more than you would this, uh, do a singleton pregnancy but if it is a monochorionic pregnancy remember the complications associated with like twin to twin transfusion and other complications are much higher <clears throat> so you need to co- call them much more often for follow up and they need to come this this question of multi fetal reduction um this is something that is being offered to many uh, at many places because they feel a singleton pregnancy is much 
easier to manage than a multiple pregnancy. So that is being, but I think none of us from St. John's have been taught how to do it. None of us would ever do it. But that is one of the things that the patient will discuss with you, which is why I uh, put this down as a point. Remember, they are at risk for preterm labor. So carefully monitor serial cervical length assessment. Many patient people put in a cervical prophylactic cervical encirclage, which is controversial. You really don't have to put it. And many people give them steroids for lung maturation, which is not really necessary unless you feel the patient is uh, very high risk for preterm labor. Labor, mode of delivery is a little controversial. Depends on the presentation, gestation age, presence of fetal complications. Usually, if the first fetus is cephalic, you can achieve a normal delivery, though people say if the first is cephalic and second is breech or transverse lie, it's better to do a cesarean. But that depends on your expertise. What is your expertise? After delivery of the first baby, are you able to, in, a, in your setup, do an internal podalic version without anesthesia? This is the only condition where we do it without anesthesia. If you can do it, you're, you're, you, know, uh, you have the expertise to do it, well, go ahead and give a vaginal delivery. Otherwise, it's better to do a cesarean section. If it's a non-vertex first twin, definitely cesarean section. And if it's locked, locked twins, how do you diagnose if it's breach? If the first is a breach, the breach is coming, but the, you know, the breach is not descending, think it could be locked twins and please offer cesarean section. Prevent PPH and offer uh, good oxytocics. Next, the next thing which I would just like to highlight is anemia. Why have I put anemia? See, most of you see a lot of anemia. And now with anemia becoming a major global problem with pregnant women, we are finding that and with the availability of iron sucrose or iron uh, FCM, we're finding people are just giving iron. In, as soon as patient comes, hemoglobin is 8 gram. You admit the patient, parental iron is given without even investigating what the cause of anemia is, which is why I have just chosen to discuss this because there is a con because they wait people will start giving injections wait and then they label it as refract if the hemoglobin does not increase they label it as refractory anemia and then they send the patient to us for further uh, evaluation now we need to understand if there's anemia anemia can be because of iron deficiency and if it's because of iron deficiency yes you have to give you can give parental iron oral line is just as good but if you don't have the time and the patient is not compliant, that's the only condition where you're going to give parental line. But remember, there can be other things like, you know, underlying renal disease, like chronic UTI. There can be an underlying bowel disease, which is prevent causing malabsorption. There can be hypothyroidism. There can be hemoglobinopathies. We have, you know, thalassemia so much. So, you know, in some belts, thalassemia is very common. So if you're going to give blood, I and mean, if you're going to give a parental line for a patient with thalassemia, you're really doing her a... Uh, this favor and there can be autoimmune hemolytic anemia which is very because autoimmune disease is so high or in some areas and maybe because of malaria so that that's not the condition where we give iron that's the condition where we need to give them blood transfusion so we need to judiciously evaluate a patient who comes you know find out whether the patient is taking the medication which you're giving okay and then find out if the patient is taking still in spite of that the hemoglobin is not increasing then you have to do her other investigations and rule out all these diseases before you start the patient on parental line if the um, hemoglobin level is restored during normal pregnancy advise her to continue iron and folic acid even for three months postpartum Okay, so the, like I said, parental line and blood transfusion is for only selected cases. So don't give it like if you're really, uh, unless you really need to give it. And antenatal blood transfusion, only if the hemoglobin is 7 grams. Because remember, antenatal blood transfusion is associated with preterm birth. So we don't want take, to take out a preterm baby. Okay, sorry, this is a bad slide. But basically, I just wanted to tell you about... Uh, we have another condition that is thrombocytopenia or low platelets in pregnancy. Why did I say that? Because there is a condition called gestational thrombocytopenia or you have autoimmune diseases like SLE and all causing thrombocytopenia or you have ITP. Every, if you find low platelets, everybody labels the patient as ITP. But it's just to highlight you, it need not be ITP. Now we have other diseases also, infectious diseases like dengue also, which cause low platelets. So remember... Gestational thrombocytopenia is a very self-limiting condition, limited to pregnancy, arises in the third trimester, 
the platelet count don't fall below one lakh. Very rarely it falls below one lakh. And then it reverts back to normal post delivery. The only thing is you need to be careful during the time of you know delivery. If the platelets are low, you need to give her platelet transfusion. SLE and other conditions, you need to evaluate the patient for that before you treat. Coming to immune th thrombocytopenia, see, remember, if you find a patient has immune thrombocytopenia, she has, she's been having thrombocytopenia even in her previous pregnancy, then what do you do? You have to refer her to a med medical specialist and treat. But there may be uh, uh, conditions where what happens, the patient may suddenly come to you in the third trimester and she's refusing to go anywhere else. And you are the only doctor there. Then in that situation, what do you do? You know, you may refer to a hematologist or take an opinion from a hematologist. But if you don't have any any facility for that, remember, you're in a rural setup, what to do? Ideal is refer. But supposing you're in a condition where you do, can't do anything, then start steroids. You can give hydrocortisone or you can start IV DEXA for the patient, okay, as advised by the hematologist. Keep your pediatricians uh, alerted, okay, and arrange for a uh, single donor platelet. If single donor platelets are not available, get your ordinary platelets from some blood bank where you manage and transfuse those intraoperatively or during delivery and make sure the patient is taken care of. Remember, never use ventus, don't use forceps for this patient and institute active management of third stage of labor. Um, remember, the NSEIs are uh, contraindicated in this patient and hand over the patient to the pediatrician. Hopefully, they will manage. Um, the next is chronic. I'm not going to discuss much of this. Chronic hypertension, OK? Uh, most of you will have, remember, pre-pregnancy, you need to change over the antihypertensive to a safe antihypertensive when the patient becomes pregnant. Antenatal care, you need to put the patient on low-dose aspirin, continue, monitor carefully throughout pregnancy, monitor both mother and fetus. The most important thing is the antihypertensive management aim for a blood pressure which should be less than 150 by 100. Remember the target organ damage, if the patient has target organ damage, like has got a renal problem or has got some uh, LFTs during the liver um, abnormal, the BP should be kept less than 140 by 90. That means the control should be better if there's target organ damage. Avoid treatment to lower the BP less than 80. If the BP is less than 80, please reduce your dose of antihypertensives. Okay. Um, coming to fe fetal monitoring, monitor the fetus carefully with ultrasound and Doppler if available, or at least with clinical examination and with ultrasound, which most of you have. Timing of delivery, if the patient is on antihypertensives, plan delivery before 37 weeks. If it is not on antihypertensive, please wait till after 37 weeks. Postnatal care, monitor carefully, continue the antihypertensives. Thank you. Um, I'm done, Dr. Nitin. Any questions? I'm done with my talk. If you have any questions. Why? Nitin, I've done with my talk, so you all can, if questions are there, I'm ready to take questions.
All right. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Anama, for that wonderful comprehensive talk of a very difficult topic, but a much needed topic as such. Um, uh, Dr. Anama, there are a few questions coming in. Any of you have questions coming in? Uh, please do post in your uh, chat box as such. The most important question that a lot of people have messaged is actually uh, when they look at a high risk pregnancy, when should they refer and how can they refer safely? The, the depends the high risk pregnancy, like I said, there can be a medical complication or an obstetric complication. Early referral is the best. So if they can have some communication with a referral center or a doctor with whom they feel comfortable with, they can see they can discuss the case with somebody. See, like I find many of our postgraduates and uh, who are practicing in rural areas do call many of us up and, you know, have a discussion. This is the patient that I have. What do I do? How do I refer? So it is, from, you know, from case to case, if they can manage, we tell them, well, you can manage and this is what you have to do. But if they want, they can discuss with some senior and they can early referral of the patient helps a lot because especially bleeding, high blood pressure, you know, patients with a lot of complications. It's better to refer the patient early rather than, you know, have complications and then send the patient and the mother dies. You know, so they can yes, have some kind of a referral communication between the two. If you're working, especially in rural centers, and if they can't, they can call up some. It's better to have a telecom, you know, communication with somebody whereby they can, you know, uh, talk to somebody and you know say, should I refer the patient? This is the closest place, or we'll tell them emergency. This is what management has to be done, and then they can refer because for each one, the referral time is different. Like for all these various things, it's different. So you can't make a, you know, it's not one uh, size fits all. The other question they want to ask is, again, with regard to resources, are there any resources available online or is there sort of a training program which is focused on high-risk obstetrics? Um, there is a, um, there are some fellowship uh, programs in Bangalore Medical College and some of these centers, but they have a simple one, one year or, you know, six month training. There's an EMOC training also in um, the government setup where they train them for these emergency situations and also to do cesarean sections emergency situations you know how to you know handle these situations there are trainings like this so if they uh, contact me we'll let them know where all these uh, training centers are or they can if they're interested in doing a proper fellowship in high-risk pregnancy there is a fellowship training program in bangalore medical college Okay, so you have fellowship courses and, of course, yes. the short-term yes. uh, training yes. courses and such. Oh, that, that's uh, wonderful, ma'am. Thank you once again for that comprehensive talk. Thank you so much for taking time off a Sunday. I know it was a busy uh, week with also the Bangalore OBG Society function. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will, as always, we will get in touch with you when the rural doctors have uh, issues. Do continue uh, guiding us. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. Thank you, Alumni Association. Thank you. Right, we move on to the um, next topic and uh, very, very important topic. In fact, uh, m quite a few of the queries that we see on the Johnite WhatsApp groups are on images as such. And how really do you interpret the image? And as simple as a chest x-ray, which gives a lot of trouble to doctors in rural service and even to us practitioners in regular day-to-day -day practice. It's my great fortune and privilege to introduce um, Dr. Binu Joy, a friend, a mentor, co-founder of the Alter Doctor and someone who was also the leading force behind starting the Johnite Academic uh, WhatsApp group uh, to really take us through today of imaging in the primary care setup. Uh, welcome, Dr. Binu. Uh, he has been the former additional professor of radiology at St. John's. He was the head of radiology at Rajgiri Hospital and now doing wonderful, uh, innovative work also in trying to uh, bridge the gap between technology and healthcare as such. Uh, welcome, Dr. Binu. Uh, if you can click on present. And slides. And click on add file from your computer. I would again like to uh, request all those of you who have joined in that if you have registered previously for the KMC CMA accreditation points, uh, please
please uh, do uh, post your name along with your batch and what center you're working in as proof of attendance. And please do post your comments or questions in the chat box as and when the talk is going. Do not wait till the end because then we will not be able to take in some of the questions. George, if sir's presentation is uploaded, please uh, put it on the screen. Sir, can you just talk so we can check your audio? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, um, am I audible and am I visible? Perfect, perfect. In that order? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect, sir, perfect. We can go ahead and the PPT is also on course. Right, right. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Nitin. And uh, uh, again, it's like being back with family, you know? Uh, and being uh, sandwiched between Dr. Anama's talk and uh, Murtaza's talk, you know, these are all people, good friends, known to us over years. Right. So without wasting much time, let me just start off. 20 minutes is a very short time to talk about an exhaustive topic like imaging. So what we'll try and do is is use context and uh, build a sort of a preamble in this, in this first talk and then... Uh, down the months, we can probably look at uh, having more such sessions. Usually, I do a long talk when it comes to chest x-rays itself. I'll use the example of chest x-rays and, and take you through a journey. Right. Uh, I purposely call this resource-constrained um, scenario rather than resource-poor. I, I want to bring about a difference here that... Uh, Constraints are essentially something we need to overcome, and we can overcome. The constraints could be of access, access to having the modality itself, access to having the right modality, even if it's an X-ray. What kind of X-ray do we have in place that we can take good quality images? Second bit, of course, most of your face is affordability. How much can my patient afford? Uh, do I treat or do I, do I image? Those are the kind of conundrums. And here I want to bring an extra constraint, which is that of knowledge. Uh, are we knowledgeable enough to take the right calls to do the right imaging at uh, different points of time, right? So imaging in these conditions, I'm, I'm making a blanket statement. You all come from different kinds of milieus, some which are semi-rural, semi-urban, very rural, and so on. And we have, we have them all still in India. Uh, let me take you through a few onlys. Many times the imaging that we do X-ray or an ultrasound is only the first look, the first time that anyone's actually looked at that patient from that perspective. Many times it is the only modality that we have. Either we have only an X-ray or only an ultrasound and we're supposed to make sense of what is happening with the patient's condition at that point of time. This might be the only time you can image the patient. Once this is done and the treatment is given or not given, you probably lose the patient after that and not back to you. So this might be the only care system that the patient has access to for miles on end. But beyond that, I want to bring in another only, which is a mental constraint, which is I'm only a primary care doctor. Never think of, never undersell your presence as only primary care, or I am not capable or equipped of doing this. There are many constraints that we may have to execute the kind of care we want to do, but our mind is not shackled. We can, we can always open it out. We can always bring in the right perspective and and help the patient. We may not be the ones executing the care. The care may be executed in another center further off. But the more you are able to give context to the even the next referring uh, referred hospital or the referred clinician, the more the patient will be helped, the less the time gap between uh, making a right diagnosis and, and moving on with the, with the care. So here, two elements become very important. Why are we imaging and when are we imaging? X-ray, for example, is, is not going to be the yet another mandatory investigation one does in like hemoglobin or, uh, or electrolytes and so on and so forth, which sometimes in, in tertiary care, one does for the sake of not missing things. Let us do it for completion sake. There is no completion sake here. This is often the first and the important, therefore, Having a differential in mind already from the history that you've got from the patient decides on the why that we need to image. And the when is important as well. The when can vary from an urgent scenario where the patient's presenting, a very acute scenario where you need to, to image. That when is very different from the other when where the patient has been treated by you once, twice, 
thrice the patients come uh, with the non non healing or uh, a, a scenario where the condition is worsening even those are the ones where you need to actually decide as to when to image with that let me just quickly take you this is this is all about images right radiology is all about images and i will largely use chest x ray for for this this initial talk and uh, i will just expect all of you to do a mental exercise or trying to recognize what is wrong with over here and a pattern which this might conform to i'm not going to do an exhaustive uh, pattern by pattern over all the 10 or 15 different kinds of patterns which are easy to recognize and and give differentials to but i just want you to quickly look and and identify just as a refresher right here you see uh, an opacity which is a well defined opacity on the on the left side this is a solitary lesion this this could be a pattern another pattern what what is the pattern that you see here i will come to this a few of these patterns i'll expand a little bit more so that you know it's uh, you, you can have a few take homes which are like solid right another pattern multiple lesions well defined lesions both all no no zones spread another pattern all these are for most of you they are familiar they are they have, you've you've been used to it and you probably have one diagnosis already in mind another important one this one this one i will i will dwell in a little bit detail as we go forward yet another one you have if, if you look at it the markings of the lungs are not seen on the on on the left side on the lateral aspect and that that conforms to something what do you see here the right diaphragm seems much more raised compared to the left side you have something on the right side mid and lower zones the definition doesn't seem very clear a little speculated and so on and also the margins are not very clear on the medial aspect it can have ominous portents cardia looks all right but lot of fluffy opacities on both sides all zones i hope that image is clear but if you look peer into the image you are you are seeing a lot of really small opacities studding across the this is a miliary pattern it can be a, a miliary or not, infectious miliary or a or a malignant miliary or, or what not those are the two common ones which are there right so we have a bunch of patterns we can look for these are probably the the ones wherein uh, you can try and pinpoint or pigeon hole them into a kind of pattern and then say now let me dive deeper i am just listing them out here for the simple reason that these are probably things you can read more about and then you can form your own algorithm in your mind which which lands where depending on the history is it acute is it chronic is it uh, how long has it lasted in the temporality of events when has it come and so on and so forth so there was the opaque hemithorax which we saw the raised diaphragm which we saw air fluid levels which we saw the horizontal line right solitary pulmonary nodule a single lesion that we saw benign versus malignant which is a, a small discussion in itself non resolving opacity you will know that it's a non resolving opacity only if you've done more than one x ray in, in case of uh, serial x rays that's when you actually look at it reticular nodular a term which is used and abused all over reticular means linear nodular means circular and often times it's difficult to make out what is what in in in, in diffuse disease so you you use a blanket term reticular nodular and miliary miliary are millet size small lesions studying the entire lung zones so let me just you know uh, let the objective not be to try and understand this comprehensively and exhaustively and so on so let's just take three of the the uh, the patterns that we saw and dive a little deeper into it if you can capture that much and have a little bit of perspective on that maybe we can build on it in the future adding adding the the other other patterns as well right or the other approaches to to looking at chest x ray and when to ask for further investigations and and so on right so we have three images here uh, all have 
opaque hemithorax. One side of the the chest is 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 opaque. Uh, what does opaque signify in pathological terms? What what happens there? Either that space is replaced with fluid, or that place is replaced with a solid, or that place is replaced with in fluid itself. It could be lymph, blood, and so on and so forth. Right? Anything other than air, which is occupying a space, is going to appear opaque over here. Now, are these three similar? Is there a difference between the three? I'll just walk you through why we need to look at it in a in a little deeper manner, and then try and and narrow it down. It for uh, ease of looking at at an opaque hemithorax, the first in the index that you should look at is the mediastinum. Where does the heart and the and the central trachea and the, the bronchi, if you can see them, where does it sit? Is it sitting dead center, like what's happening on the upper image, or has it moved towards the the opacity itself, like what's happening on the left side image, the trachea also you can see is shifted, or has it moved away from the opacity as it's seen on the right side image? What does this mean essentially? If it's moved towards the opacity, essentially we are dealing with a loss of, of you know, lung, lung lesion which has happened over there, where, where there is a loss of lung or lung volume. And therefore, the mediastinum in the cardia has been pulled towards the opacity, right? So that that can happen in in large collapses. It can happen in 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 you know very evolved fibrotic sort of a picture, or in a in a in a child. If you see it, it could even be an agenesis or a or a or a block wherein which is which is led to a collapse of the lung and therefore the push to that side, right? So that now if you see it move away from the, the opacity, the mediastinum and the heart, away from the opacity, what does it mean? Here, it is something which is space, large space occupying lesion, which is done that. Either it's a massive effusion, unilateral effusion, which has pushed it, or it's a, it's a large mass of some kind, which is, which has pushed it in the, in the opposite direction. These are the ones. And rarely, we do find the mediastinum in the center as well, which is usually where there is neither volume loss or volume gain it is it happens where there is cons large consolidation with hardly any volume increase or decrease so so this is something which will give you an index as to hey what am i dealing with am i dealing with something which is you know uh, volume increasing or a volume decreasing thing therefore i can the next thing that you need to do is look a little deeper into the into into, into the image itself into the opacity itself sometimes you may get pointers if you see lucent lines which are going through uh, these black lines, which are passing through the, the opacity. And that's what's called air bronchodam, which is essentially in large consolidations, you, you still have air left in the, in the secondary bronchi and so on, which is being visible there. Uh, you might see calcification within, or you might see in, in small babies, rarely you might find uh, bony tissue or teeth-like ap ap appearing tissue within which then would tell us that it's like a you know, germ cell tumor or a teratoma or something like that, which is causing the, the same thing. So I hope you know there's a, there's a way to sort of look at this pattern and then dive one step deeper. You could dive much deeper by looking more into it and then taking, or you always go back and take history. Once you encounter something which you're unfamiliar with or you, you didn't expect it and you're seeing it, you would always go back and, and, and ask the patient for further history towards the pointer towards the diagnosis. Next one is the elevated diaphragm. Now, elevated diaphragm, what is the definition of an elevated diaphragm? It's a, it's, it's a diaphragm. Typically, one diaphragm is going to be higher than the other. Cardia sits on the left, you lower. Uh, the difference shouldn't be more than one and a half of uh, you know, intercostal spaces. Uh, up to two is fine. Much more than that, there is a raised aspect to the the diaphragm. Now, this can be a real raised diaphragm or it can be an apparent raised diaphragm. The apparent happens uh, typically when there is something else which is simulating uh, the raising of the diaphragm and opacity over there, like a subpulmonic effusion, which can appear like, you know, the diaphragm itself is raised. Let us, for the for the sake of our discussion today, let us keep it at, at uh, the real raised diaphragms, right? Now, the real raised di diaphragm can be due to multiple causes. It could be 
supradiaphragmatic, diaphragmatic, or infradiaphragmatic causes. Again, when you go back to history, you'll be able to elicit some of that. From the image itself, you might be able to elicit some of that. For example, when you look at this, there is also the, the right side lung is also got multiple opacities, you know. So there could be a collapse associated with it, and there and the diaphragm could be raised. That's one aspect of it. What is another supradiaphragmatic cause, which is not necessarily related to the lung itself? It could be a, a phrenic nerve palsy, which is leading to that. When the diaphragm is not moving, so it's, it's sort of staying in one, one location. That could be others. What are the uh, then again? fluid under the lungs, but it's still above the diaphragm, can simulate it. So it again becomes a supradiaphragmatic. Diaphragmatic can be diaphragm-related causes why th that's happening. The, it's staying higher. And infradiaphragmatic, or a bunch of them, liver issues, alternatively uh, is issues on the on the left side. And uh, if diaphragmatic, the other things which can happen are, are things like the hernias and the ventilations and so on wherein the diaphragmatic musculature itself is weak and you can have the up and down happening. Now, many of these, uh, you would need to dig deeper for history. And then again, you might not get your answer immediately even then. You might need to go one step further and evaluate. Uh, both in places where there is ultrasound and not common now, and where, where fluoroscopy is available, you can actually do, you can evaluate the diaphragm real time. What do I mean by real time? Real time is a great usage of, of imaging to see what happens when the body is actually in motion. When you see the heart pumping, when you see the, the vasculature moving, when you can do maneuvers on that, when you can actually see, watch and uh, encourage the patient to do movements and actually watch the, the organ while the, uh, the uh, patient is in movement. And this is where fluoroscopy really comes into play, or even ultrasound, because it's a real-time investigation. This will help us uh, discern what is actually happening, whether it's a diaphragmatic issue or not. Many times we don't have the, the availability of that modality, but that's all right. Uh, you would still be pointing in a direction where you know further management is required, and management is required to elicit that, right? Air fluid levels. You saw one, if you remember, a third or fourth X-ray that we saw, had an air fluid level. Now that air fluid level had a particular nature, right? I'll come to that. What are we seeing here? We are seeing two kinds of, of uh, uh, a, a patients, probably two different pathologies which have got air fluid levels. Do you think they are the same? Uh, straight away, do you think there is a difference between the two? This is another where you're seeing multiple air fluid levels. That is another thing which can happen. I'll go back to the previous one. The difference between the two. If you see the air fluid level bridging the entire span of the thorax from the chest wall all the way to the mediastinum or the, or the hilum, uh, the chances are that it is not a lung lesion, that it's, it's, it's more of a, a hydropneumothorax or a pyoneumothorax or whatever it is, right? Because then it will just layer across the, the mediastinum. If you see it in a more contained fashion, like what happens in, in the left image here or this image here. You know that it is a lung lesion, probably a lung abscess, which has got the, the fluid there. So that is one thing. So they would need drainage. If they're large, both would need drainage, but the, the way of draining them would, would be different and, and the, the approach also would be different. What about this? The multiple air fluid levels. When you see multiple air fluid levels, with no discernible diaphragm that you see on the same side, the possibility of, of either multi-loculated collections can be there, or very commonly, it could be a diaphragmatic hernia of some kind with the loops having gone up, and then it's it's all simulating this way. So one point I want to make at this, this stage is, these are all erect images. None of them are supine images, as you can imagine, right? You need to have gravity to actually see that air fluid level and so on. So it's important what kind of X-ray units you have. And if you have, uh, do you have a chest stand which helps you take good chest X-rays? For the, for the centers which don't yet have good quality X-ray units and you're going for it, you'd be best served going for a reasonably good equipment. Um, there are many which are available. And uh, when 
you are you're working with uh, little inferior quality machines you have to understand that the quality of the images will also be accordingly inferior in in, in different ways a uh, supine image is never going to give many of the the information that a, that a direct image needs to give like for example what happens in chest itself so now i'll quickly come to uh, i've kept this purposely short so that you what you take back shouldn't be too many things so it sort of stays in your mind and we can do multiple sessions like this when to ask for an opinion when you encounter see what why it was important to to know patterns is that with known patterns you have the known differentials in mind you could encounter an unfamiliar pattern which happens to everybody including radiologists so if there is an un unfamiliar pattern or if there's a non resolving um, lesion which you've seen across the x-rays that you've seen oftentimes you don't have the luxury of of seeing multiple images but if you do non resolving then you need to ask for an opinion say what next and a doubtful finding i don't know whether there is a lesion there there could be a lesion there that sort of thing right so th these are contexts where you would need to ask for a you know an, an opinion what to ask for correlation as a next step many times you might need to ask for something which may exist within your facility or you may have to refer out but when you do that you need to be fairly clear what you're asking for one is a correlation ultrasound i think this could be fluid but can you just check and tell me that it is actually fluid and if fluid what kind of fluid effusion can be different kinds right uh, i'm not i'm not dwelling too much on ultrasound today because ultrasound is a beautiful imaging modality of of great use but you know it's a, it's another topic in itself but quickly i'll tell you you can differentiate between clear fluid a transudate kind of a fluid versus uh, an exudative uh, fluid of chronic nature like in tuberculosis which could be fibrinous and thin or it could be multi loculated it could have internal echoes which tell us it's either blood or pus or what not is there a role of ct scan can i ask for a ct scan based on what i see on an x ray yes many times non resolving lesions yes you can ask for a ct scan then to see what's underlying over there and fluoroscopy like we just spoke about so it's crucial whenever possible check priors see if there are any previous imaging of any kind which is available please take them and compare it will give you a wealth of information look for temporality if you have priors look for uh, during this period of time what has happened when right how many months has it taken right there is there's a concept called doubling time if it the if the apparent size of the of the lesion that you see on an x ray has grown too fast less the in within less than let's say a month in in a week, matter of weeks time it has a particular sort of a potent compared to if it is growing visibly but it's growing over months versus if it's hardly grown over a period of 1 to 2 years all have different meanings if it's growing too fast it is not likely to be malignant it's likely to be inflammatory infective if it is growing visibly over months the possibility of malignancy cannot be ruled out you need to check further and if it's not really grown at all over a period or a very minimal growth over uh, 18 months 24 months 36 months then it is very likely to be benign so th this is the reason why if you have multiple look at them and you know and secondly you know I, this is this is uh, volume cannot be made out easily on on two dimensional images right so the rule of thumb is if the size seems to be about 25% more in diameter you know, whatever arbitrary diameter then it's likely to have grown double the volume right 26% is what they say but yeah around about uh, one fourth more if it's become so it's essentially doubled in volume retake history many times what you see on images makes you go back and and retake history you retake that history and then sort of you know try and arrive at the diagnosis quickly i'll last few slides i'll go through what is the use of ultrasound first image that we have over here uh that is the liver uh towards the lower part which is um over here and the and the diaphragm and then there is there is something else which looks exactly like the liver on the superior aspect as well i'm just giving you superior inferior whatever by how we scan but you can say right left whatever where the asterisk is put that is above the diaphragm right so that looks like liver again now just use the analogy of what you what you read in pathology 
the hepatization aspect of it. This is essentially consolidation. This is how consolidation looks. A consolidated lung will look very much like liver on grayscale. When you see that, you know that it is consolidation, right? And in the in the lower two images, you can see a tongue-like structure which is jutting out. The black stuff is the fluid, and the tongue-like structure that you see is collapsed lung, right? The, the, the collapsed lung is 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 it will be a small tongue-like structure with juts, and we know that we are we are encountering a collapse over there. And another asterisk that you see in this upper image that is fluid. That is that is fluid, and in this case, clear fluid will be totally black. What we are seeing here is fluid with some gray dots within internal echoes. So that could be some either blood or, or pus or you know something probably exudative otherwise. When to ask for CT scans, non-resolving. You're not you know you you've treated the patient symptomatically then with antibiotics then with higher antibiotics and hardly any change. You would need to. Uh, and you're seeing an opacity. The upper one is a is is a consolidation which is occupying the right upper lobe. Uh, so then you would need to know what's happening here. Is it something which is blocking the bronchus and then causing uh, is a, something bizarre, something uh, ominous which sits there? Second one is already pointing us towards malignancy. It's got a speculated margin, and um, it is it is sort of ill-defined, and it's sitting there, and that could very well be a malignancy, and it definitely needs next level imaging right so i'll close with a recent vignette uh, i have a uh, i have a few uh, doctors from from uh, primary care and remote uh, centers in india who uh, correspond regularly with me and so this is one from gujarat um, from two weeks back to two and a half weeks back a uh, young patient about 20 years came to this doctor of ours and uh, the ultrasound with 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 acute pain abdomen the ultrasound showed um, fluid um, a lot of free fluid in the abdomen and the, the free fluid the, the black stuff like i said is a fluid and this is uh, from <laughs> the whatsapp clinic so this is what comes to to many of us uh, for diagnosis and help and so on so this is a still from the videos loops which were sent to me and uh, this this fluid has also got some septations and some internal echoes and all that. So that was there. Young patient, uh, acute history, and uh, uh, you know, very short duration and pain abdomen, diffuse pain abdomen. Um, so what are the what are the possibilities? You know, uh, young patient, um, female has different implications. Young patients, male has other implications as well. So free fluid per se, like when you what you see here, in a scenario of uh, of liver disease could be SBP, you know, uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, it it could otherwise, if there is a history of trauma, however trivial, it could still be a large uh, hemoperitoneum of some kind. All this can have echoes within. Uh, so 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 those are the possibilities which exist. So, well, however. Very short history, um, unlikely to be gyne possibilities. One needs to also rule out perforation in the hollow viscous. Right? Do you perfor any of those things? Very young person, you wouldn't know what may have caused it. So as we were having this conversation and this image was, you know, I, I, I was walking through the, the differentials with the doctor. Uh, the, the point that, you know, if it's a perforation, you know, we should do a chest X-ray and the chest X-ray got done. And what we saw on the X-ray was air under the diaphragm on the, on the, on the right side. So this is, this is, this is classical. This is, you know, you have uh, air here and, um, and not always are you going to get on an erect image, a good air under the diaphragm kind of a picture if it's sort of sealed off and, you know, it's been a little old or whatnot. But in this case, it was quite classical and it was referred uh, quickly and uh, fortunately, young patient, robust, landed up in the hospital, got operated immediately, and the patient's doing fine and all that kind of stuff, right? So the, the last point I want to make here, technically speaking, is is even though you're looking for air under the diaphragm, you do a chest X-ray, you don't do an abdomen X-ray, all right? Because abdomen X-rays, the 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 rays pass uh, sort of ta tangentially towards the diaphragm, and you may not see the difference between the liver surface and the 
and the and the diaphragm because it's passing tangentially. The centering of the chest X-ray is such that it sort of hits it a little more parallel, so you can actually see the difference between the the diaphragm and the and the next solid structure which is under that. So use chest X-ray when you're suspecting a uh, do you uh, um, hollow viscous perforation, making sure it covers the the diaphragm as well. So yeah, I think with that. Uh, I come to the end of this and we can open out for a few quiz, queries. So thanks again. Thanks for having me. And uh, Nitin, yeah, over to you. At the risk of sounding like a bad pun, it was a joyful presentation uh, indeed. Um, bad, bad pun indeed. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Binu, and a lot of responses coming in that. Uh, and it's, uh, it's all very good to read in the books and all that, but to someone actually explain and tell what are those little subtle points you can pick up and sort of looking at patterns and like you mentioned the temporality and all that uh, is very very uh, uh, important so we have a question from rahul uh, from the batch of 2014 who asks for a left sided raised diaphragm how many ic space difference should be there to sort of call it elevated hemi diaphragm great question see all these are you know <clears throat> about 30 years back, we would actually quantify these things and say <coughs> one and a half spaces difference between uh, <clears throat> when the right um, is raised over the left, right is anyway supposed to be raised. Uh, it's all right. But when the left is raised, uh, what, do, what then does one look at? See, even a, even a one intercostal difference between the two and, on the, and when, the, when the left is raised above the right uh, or thereabouts, your index of suspicion should be there. Because most of the time, see, it could be perfectly physiological, you know, both cases. I apologize for the revelry which is happening around and the drum beats. Can't avoid that. Anyways, so yeah, so great question. Uh, whenever you see anything where the left is higher than the right, you let your index of suspicion be there, that there is a possible um, pathology which, which is there and keep your eye out. I'm not saying that you need to go chasing behind any of this, but let your index of suspicion include if any other investigation is getting done or any other. Sometimes what can happen is you can have a very bloated, you know, very distended stomach or a, or a, or a, a splenic fracture, which is thing, you know, splinting it in some form. Many times that the technical details can, can sort of simulate a little bit of, you know, the unevenness between the two. But the, the point is is well taken. We used to say if it is, uh, we need to see like two spaces or so on the right side, one or one and a half spaces on the left would would suffice to say that there is a um, elevated diaphragm. Yeah. So just to summarize, basically any elevation in the left side. On the left side, so keep an eye. Yeah. Keep an eye. Uh, keep a high index of suspicion, and if patient symptoms are correlating with it, go forward and evaluate. Then dig further. So the next question is from Helen, who asks as to which quality X-ray is better in diagnosis. So it's yeah, uh, by quality of X-ray, quality of X-ray equipment. I'll start with um, than the quality of uh, assuming that you know they have more powerful X-rays which come out and so on. So these uh, these are rated as uh, you know milliampere second ratings of you know uh, hundred ma. Uh, 200 MA or 500 MA or whatever they, the the ones which sit in most of our medical college and uh, big hospital setups are the 500 MA units, which are you know which are fairly powerful. Uh, as a as an analogy, even for the people who are who are working in big hospitals, the ones you take as a portable into your wards and into your ICUs, they are the 100 MA units. So all, all, automatically already the penetration is poorer. The the what you get is is uh, not as ideal as you would need with good penetration to, to be able to see subtle opacities, right? I didn't emphasize too much on reticulonodular and all too much today because most of us don't deal with those kind of things in our uh, peripheral setups. So that is one aspect of it. The second bit is knowing what is required. For example, you know, if an erect image is required, make sure the erect gets taken. Uh, you know, if you don't, then you know, uh, no point looking for fluid levels, be it in the abdomen or be it in the chest. Uh, when you do a proper chest X-ray, rotate the shoulders out so that the scapulae are, are outturned and you can see the lateral aspect of the 
the lung feels clearer. No, so so these are important. When you're doing supine images, ideally the table on which you do it, it's radio parent agreed, but well, it should also have something called a bucky unit. You know, it's a it, it's something which helps give sharper images. And for for spine images and for abdomen images, having that makes a world of difference as to the quality of what you do. So more than the the X-ray. So I mean, I I I assume the question query was more to do with what is the the kind of X-ray equipment also which needs to be there now. Mostly everybody's moved into, into the digital space. So digitizers are available, right? The CR, the computerized digitizing unit is there, not the DR. Direct units are not, it's, they're very expensive. They are not there in most places, especially in, the, in our primary secondary care context. But the, the uh, digitizer, which is still a cassette, but the cassette gets put into the, there's no wet film and all those things anymore. Directly, you put it into a unit which digitizes the, the image and gives us a, um, a an image which is digital straight away. You know, so so those are again, I think, uh, both for ease of work as well as for to disseminate to you know get better uh, information quickly. They are quite useful. So uh, these would be the, the the two key things I would say for good quality X-rays to be taken. Right. Thank you so much. I think uh, um, the doubts will keep coming in the WhatsApp group with the uh, uh, impression of uh, how to interpret and how to report X-rays, when to refer for CT, when to refer MRI. I think wonderful talk covering the basics. And of course, we look forward to having more such uh, sessions as uh, such. Um, we. Uh, there, there's a lot of dumb sharats going on between the two speakers as such. Uh, thank you, Dr. Binu. Uh, it is now my privilege to introduce a very good friend, my senior, and someone who is very, very passionate about teaching, very passionate about whatever he does, Dr. Murtuda Gia. Uh, he's a STEM professor of emergency medicine in Maharashtra. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Code Blue, which is a... a wellness platform for doctors, someone who is spreading awareness of burnout in doctors and physicians as uh, such and how really not to, to deal with the toxicities in workplace. But today he'll be talking about actual toxicology as such, which you would encounter in rural areas. Uh, Murtu, have you uploaded your presentation? Uh, ye yes, Jaja. I mean, yes, Nitin, I have. Yeah. Uh, so uh, can George put the presentation on the screen? Perfect. Wow, super. Yeah. yeah. All over to you, Dr. Murtuza, to take over busting toxicology myths in the rural practice. And if you have any questions, please do drop it in the chat box and Dr. Murtuza will answer it. Please do not wait till the end of the session because then we will not be able to take it. Please do drop it as and when the talk is happening. Over to you, Dr. Murtuza. Super. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I understand that you you can't unmute and speak. This is what I would have liked to make it truly interactive. But uh, before we begin, I, I understand that you spent a good couple of hours on the screen. And I'd love it if you all want to stretch. Like I would get up and stretch, but I think my jeans are really old. I don't want you all to see that. So I won't get up and stretch, but you all can. And I'll just do a little upper limb stretches. So last evening in the gym, I had done my upper limb anyway. So I'm just going to do a quick stretch. It may appear a bit silly, but you can't imagine how much uh, stretching has an effect on one's well-being, attention. I think I read somewhere in physiology that it actually releases some endorphins. So please do this. Drink a glass of water. Smile to yourself. Crack a joke so that you're fresh and ready for, for some more information. I'm going to uh, not keep this information heavy. To be honest, I've actually given very, very few facts in this discussion. It's largely just guidelines, consensus statements, and, and all of that. So uh, it's just about uh, something that you can read yourself. I don't even have to speak. And that's why I, I insisted initially that uh, we have the mics on so that you all can speak. But that, that doesn't matter. What we'll do now is uh, quickly give you the content. So look at this. What we're doing is discussing a rule. Again, it's an unsaid rule. It's not really there in, in a book. It's there in consensus guidelines, the rules of toxicology doses and tox screens, the rule of the redundance of gastric lavage, this, this myth of activated charcoal, uh, the even bigger myth of whole bowel irrigation, 
and the biggest myth of all the myth of alkalinization of urine okay they're going to uh, go and crack each of these and uh, hopefully if not gain more information at least we'll gain some wisdom at the end of this session important please keep making short notes don't write sentences just words because uh, as i warn you all uh, in the end there is no conclusion you all have to give the conclusion in the chat box so the collective words or phrases you all throw into the chat box that will be the conclusion for this session because i don't have a conclusion uh, again like i jaja uh, nitin may have warned you all uh, i'm extremely passionate about what i do i love drama so <laughs> a lot of our discussion today will be revolving around some emotional drama so fasten your seat belts quick references i've just taken up a couple of textbooks but usually a lot of it is from uh, journals and uh, like i said consensus guidelines so here comes the first one uh, i would really prefer to be honest if you all read this aloud now that you all can't unmute your mics just read it aloud be honest to yourself and read this with me less than 10 times a single therapeutic dose seldom causes life threatening symptoms the exception to this so this is the rule so if somebody says i took five tablets of whatever they usually take uh, let's say they're taking cinerizine for something and they've taken five tablets you just have to not worry about it don't refer them to some nearby icu which will just you know fleece uh, one fourth of their life savings for one day in the icu it's not necessary the rule by and large is at least 10 times of your regular medication dose if you've taken then let's talk business because less than that i'm not even going to look at you i'm just going to send you home or admit you in some ward the only time you break this rule is for opioids for lithium digoxin and coumarin coumarins are basically like warfarin yeah so all of these even two or three times the standard dose if you've taken uh, then i will take you seriously so this is a good rule it's actually helped me a lot because if you think think of toxins there are just never ending list of toxins and and drugs for that matter which people take accidentally or uh, or deliberately it can go into hundreds and even thousands so i mean <laughs> at the end of the day every day i come to the emergency department and they say somebody is overdose on something it leaves me anxious like what will this what is going to happen but this kind of rule just it's like a it's like a, a, a invisible hand on my back saying murtu rule of 10 easy take a breath nothing is going to happen 9 on 10 nothing happens okay so uh, this is a good rule i keep it very very close to my heart moving on to the next one i'd like it if you all read this with me for legal purposes some authorities recommend that a venous blood also urine sample be taken from patients admitted in coma of unknown reason and kept refrigerated until the patient is discharged a toxicological anal analysis may be requested should the patient die but more importantly more importantly the value of an exact diagnosis must be weighed against the economic impact of drug screenings in many patients who would not benefit from them now i don't know how, in, in your setups uh, uh, do always uh, the, the old school thinking of just taking samples and keeping just to protect yourself there is somebody one in a million chance comes and says okay this happened do you have samples you can say oh we do have it if that's the practice uh, at some level we need to start questioning it and if you i'm not saying you go and fight with the administrators of your small setups but at least keep it at the back of your mind start negotiating drop in little hints and hopefully at the end of one or two years you may notice some change so i've spoken to some doctors in mumbai uh, there are people uh, who are really scared of legal issues for some reason Uh, they have kept samples for one year two years in the fridge and it's rotting and uh, there are other hospitals like mine i work in a small trust hospital we don't have a fridge to store some of our important drugs so there you see how the uh, the resources are being wasted okay we're going to move on then uh, to one of my other favorite rules the gastric lavage okay now look at this the value safety and efficacy of gastric lavage is i put in invert commas inverted commas because straight away taken from a consensus guideline the value safety and efficacy of gastric lavage is questionable please repeat this after me the value safety and efficacy of gastric lavage is questionable current evidence indicates this is from a toxicology book that neither gastric lavage nor induced emesis significantly changes the clinical course in mild and moderate poisonings 
toxicologically important. Quantities of drugs are seldom recovered. Now, there's also some science here. Now, you see the average size of any tablet. Okay, let's say paracetamol, whatever uh, in your rural setup is being overdosed frequently. The average size of a paracetamol tablet, a dolo, and you take the Riles tube that you have in your department. Now, try to squeeze that dolo through that. Even half the dolo is not going to come out. Okay, so this is the standard, this is the logic. Most tablets do not come out through Riles tube. So if you're thinking you'll put Riles tube and you lavage and bring out the tablets, you won't be doing it. Or at best, you'll be fooling yourself and the patients. So question is, is this really going to benefit? Maybe not. Significantly does not change the course in mild and moderate poisoning. And to be honest, most of the toxicology cases we see, at least 70-80% of them are a mild to moderate poisonings which would be around in and around that less than 10 times the normal dose type of poisoning. And so you have to question yourself, are we really, really going to benefit from this activity? The gastric lavage may instead, the third point here, third bulletin point, gastric lavage may instead increase the severity of poisoning by dissolving the substance and enhancing its absorption. Okay, so till now I've been telling you that doing the gastric lavage is useless. Now I'm telling you it's potentially harmful. The consensus statement based on avail available evidence, there are no definite indications for use of gastric lavage, even within one hour of oral ingestions. So until four years ago, uh, my training in emergency medicine was that you can do gastric lavage if somebody comes to you less than one hour after ingestion of a toxin. This evidence is even questioning that. So if somebody is coming to you after two hours, forget about, don't even utter the word gastric lavage. You, you'll end up sinning, literally. So if it's less than one hour, I won't say don't do it. Do it, but just know that it's not the most important thing in the world. So I would still, personally, if somebody came with less than one hour and I believe that this is more than moderate poisoning, the dose is seeming more than 10 times, I'd say I would probably do it. Yeah? But otherwise, you can, mix, as, as clearly mentioned, it's absolutely useless. So never carry out gastric lavage without good reason. Let's repeat this once more. Never carry out gastric lavage without good reason. Moving on, the myth of activated charcoal. Okay, first of all, we need to know something about activated charcoal before we debust the myth. The single dose is one to two grams per kg body weight. Or if you're not, uh, if you don't want to use this, the other rule is whatever the drug, the mass of the drug that the patient has consumed, multiply that into 10. So supposing someone's taken paracetamol, 650 mg, 10 tablets. Okay, so that is 650 into 10 is 6 grams approximately. 6.5 grams of, of paracetamol is what they've consumed. So you multiply that into 10. So that's approximately uh, 60 grams, 66, 65 grams of activated charcoal, which comes to same as 1 gram per kg body weight in this case. Okay. Now look at the point number 3. Ideally, activated charcoal should be given within 1 to 2 hours of ingestion of the poison. Activated charcoal administration may be considered up to four to six hours after injection Injection if gastric emptying is delayed. Now, question is, when is gastric emptying delayed? Okay. Typically, poisons uh, like antipsychotics, for example, they have an anticholinergic side effect. Now, because there is an anticholinergic side effect of antipsychotics, some antidepressants, uh, the gastric emptying is delayed. Now, because of that, the entire times the, 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 the toxin spends in the upper GI tract is longer. And hence, even after one to two hours, you'll say, okay, I'll give this person activated charcoal because they are likely to benefit from it. Okay. So now how I remember activated charcoal is not necessarily where to give it because uh, it's, it's a big list. I would, uh, I would memorize where not to give it. And that you can see is a really, really small list. The last point here. Iron, let's repeat this with me, iron, lithium, they both are together, both are charged metals, correct? Iron is Fe2+, plus, Li+. Plus. So two charged metals in one, in one block, alcohols, hydrocarbons in another block, then cyanides, strong acids, acids and strong bases in another block. So in all of them, activated charcoal, I will definitely give, sorry, I will not give. Once you keep this in mind, in any anything and everything else, you can consider activated. I won't say give, but I'll say can consider. You have the activated charcoal. They've come to you one to two hours. Any toxin under the sun, give them the benefit of doubt. Give them the activated charcoal. 
the only unforgivable mistake here is if you give activated charcoal to somebody who has one of these six or seven toxins I've mentioned at the last point in the slide. Now comes the fun part. So I don't know. It depends. I think I've done a few conferences in various parts of India where I've asked people from different uh, uh, regions. Everybody seems to be giving this tablet Flatuna. So if that's the truth, please uh, uh, say yes or put a thumbs up in the chat box. So I'll know if this Flatuna pandemic is, is truly a pandemic or is it just restricted to a couple of states that I have done conferences in. Do you all give Flatuna to people uh, as activated charcoal? Actually, I can't see the chat, but I believe that some of you are religiously typing away something to keep yourselves active. Uh, Nitin, is there something on the chat that's popping up? Okay, I'm going to believe, actually, I, I can't figure this out. I'm going to believe that most of you are using Flatuna because that makes this topic interesting. Now, look at that. Look at Flatuna. Uh, I've put the contents. It has Symethicone 80 mg and has activated charcoal 250 mg. Okay, each tablet. Now we just uh, gave. I just we just simulated a case of paracetamol toxin, and we all said that uh, ideally you need 60 grams of 60 grams of uh, of uh, activated charcoal for this paracetamol poison. Now 60 grams is how many tablets of activated charcoal? So one tablet is 250 mg. So four tablets is one gram. Now I want to give 60 grams. So I'm going to give four into 60. Just do the math. It's 240. 240 tablets of this Flatuna has to be given to one poor human being who's already suffered because of an overdose. And you're going to shove 240 tablets of these down that person's throat. So it doesn't make any sense. So not just does it not make sense because it's expensive and it's logistically unfeasible. It's dangerous. The reason it's dangerous is look at the second uh, content. I said Symethicone. Symethicone 80 mg. Now the toxic dose of Symethicone is up to 4 or 5 times this. You're giving 250 times <laughs> Symethicone's toxic dose to somebody who probably doesn't need it or needs it. But it's just completely mindless. So th this whole thing about giving this tablet is actually very, very questionable. What you really, if you really want to help your patients, uh, what you need to do is get pure activated charcoal. And unfortunately, uh, I, I couldn't find this anywhere. I uh, found this on Amazon <laughs> to find pure activated charcoal. Uh, and I presented this at a national conference where one person gave me the contact of a pharmaceutical company that makes uh, proper activated charcoal and is willing to deliver it to your hospital uh, at some cost. So at the end of this discussion, if you all want, please uh, send in uh, an email or a WhatsApp message to Nitin and he'll forward it. And I'll give you the contact of this agent who actually sells. Uh, just a disclaimer, I don't get paid by these guys. I'm quite happy with my salary. Whatever chiller they have to offer, I don't really want that. This is just to tell you all that what are the scams that run when it comes to uh, the thinking that we have in terms of activated charcoal. Moving on to the last myth and possibly the most uh, penultimate myth and probably one of the most irritating myths again of a whole bubble irrigation. So let's, in the interest of academics, first learn what is this whole bubble irrigation. You take PEG, polyethylene glycol, solution of that. One to two liters is given orally uh, or by the nasogastric tube. In case that's what you enjoy doing, putting nasogastric tube for every person who has some kind of uh, toxic overdose. You do that, you give uh, one to two liters and and keep on waiting for the stools to pass until the, until the rectal affluent becomes clear. Uh, usually two to six hours it takes and you see that the stool is absolutely clear then you say okay we've actually washed everything out of this guy's gut including all all the potential toxins now uh, when would this be in some ways this is doing what activated charcoal did preventing the absorption of the toxin uh, into the bloodstream from the gut so activated charcoal was doing the same thing this is also doing the same thing only difference is activated charcoal was doing it a bit higher up in the gi tract that's why we were, you know, first two hours, we want to do it, maximum four hours. This you can do it even a little later. So especially, see point number four, poisoning with low, slow-release substances. Because these slow-release substances will go slower, move gradually, go into the small intestine and then release their toxins. So at that point, activated charcoal may or may not work as well. And at that point, you may have to consider whole bowel irrigation. So sustained release tablets, if you see that, Anybody has overdose on sustained release tablets, you may want to consider whole bowel irrigations. 
okay uh, of course uh, the contraindications literally or the sinful use of whole bowel irrigation would be in poisons where it's not useful specifically not useful and the examples of that you may want to t- tell yourself aloud i'll give you a pause of 5 seconds because i'm fed up of listening my listening to my own voice 5 seconds think of those six poisons where activated charcoal does not work okay there's an error here sorry the poisons where activated charcoal does not work is where this is used okay so activated charcoal if it does not work then you are actually helpless and then your only true friend is this whole bowel irrigation okay so there are six or seven poisons we said there's lithium and iron then we said the strong acids strong bases alcohol and hydrocarbons hydrocarbons are basically petroleum kerosene and those kind of things yeah? hydrocarbons so these are the few things where activated charcoal will not work and then you will say okay boss i'm going to go and give whole bowel irrigation the rest of the times you don't have to give it it actually will not work the only good thing it will do is give this patient a nice bit of purging and make this patient feel good but it's actually not going to do much to the toxicology and there it comes the top secret <laughs> there are no definite definite indications for the use and further study is needed to determine any possible benefit of whole bowel irrigation so in my practice the only time i would even say the word whole bowel irrigation is if i knew that it's one of those six or seven exceptional uh, toxins where even activated charcoal which is usually a harmless uh, drug which i would give for most patients except those six here only for those six i will consider it otherwise i won't even talk about it all right we're going to end with this last uh, myth of alkalinization of urine i put it right at the end because it's, it's so useless that it doesn't even deserve any more than one minute of today's discussion how is this done <laughs> the belief is that some drugs are ionized they undergo iron trapping in the urine at elevated urine ph okay that means in an alkaline urine ph it's likely that these drugs are excreted so a urine ph of greater than 7.5 uh, 20 to 30 milliequivalents of soda bicarb is added in 50% dextrose and this is infused at 250 to 300 ml per hour now alkalinization of urine per se it's not done for alkalinizing the urine uh, there are only one or two exceptions i would say tricyclic antidepressants in tricyclic antidepressant toxicity especially if you see the qrs is prolonging or the qt is prolonging or the patient has hypotension or the patient has seizures you need to alkalinize the patient with soda so with uh, uh, soda bicarb but you are alkalinizing the patient not necessarily to alkalinize the urine in all of this leaving so uh, leaving out tricyclic antidepressants there is absolutely no role otherwise to even think about alkalinizing someone's urine to top it up if you want to commit a even bigger sin of alkalinization of urine doing fad which is forced alkaline diuresis giving soda bicarb and then giving lasix to say i will forcibly alkalinize alkalinize and diurate you is even a bigger sin so please please don't do this absolutely no role in toxicology as promised i'm going to end with just some thought some silence uh, and in this silence i really really to make this really impactful so that i sleep well at night that i have contributed something which leads to real action in the community i'd like it uh, for all of you to think and type in in the chat box words or phrases which is the conclusion of this 15 minute discussion just words or phrases please don't be shy throw in any word any phrase uh, it will definitely leave an impact collectively on all of us that is the conclusion i don't have a conclusion sorry guys you have to make the conclusion no your this slide is a very good enough uh, conclusion dr uh, murtuza so uh, people have actually so there are some questions coming in as such and one of the question is is potassium permanganate advisable for gastric lavage as immediate treatment for uh, uh, you know op poisoning or uh, homicides yeah yeah so gastric lavage is advisable but it it has no additional advantage over uh, regular uh, lavage or using even soda bicarb as a lavaging mechanism so it has no additional benefit 
the one time when i would say uh, okay, uh, uh, where this has exceptional advantage uh, where potassium permanganate has is in uh, rat poison especially when it's uh, aluminum phosphide zinc phosphide based because there uh, using regular lavage with just water is actually dangerous because water is going to combine with aluminum phosphide and release phosphine gas and so not to protect the patient but to protect your doctors and nurses i would say don't use water in that case in that case uh, it's exceptional to use potassium permanganate but in other cases it has no additional advantage so stick to what you already have right uh, rahul has a question even for aspirin poisoning we don't need to alkalinize the urine uh, yeah i think that's it. i'm glad you brought it up yeah i think it's one of those things which i would say uh, i wouldn't call it a sin if you did it you do it fine there is uh, some literature about it it's not compelling evidence to be honest the com- only compelling evidence to to manage aspirin poisoning is dialysis that 100% works and again that there are, there are uh, aspirin levels uh, when you see severe toxicity signs neurologically that's when you say this will definitely work i'm putting my money on this alkalinization of urine in aspirin questionable i wouldn't stop you if you did it definitely not a sin but uh, i wouldn't say it's the, it's the uh, most important thing to do and it will uh, say that you know i I've, I've alkalinized the urine and i've, I've treated the patient as per but i'm glad you brought it up this is another uh, uh, poison where let's say it's okay thank you rahul good job all right so the other question i want to ask you is more of a practical approach and what are and very sort of crisp uh, answer three points to keep in mind when dealing with patients in a rural setup in the emergency Yeah. to avoid so, escalation of issues yeah yeah i think uh, f- first thing is once you're well read no you automatically uh, exuberate confidence uh, confidence and patients can see that so that's really important to be a little bit sure of what you're doing keep reading the more you read the more confident you get and they sense it the second is to keep the patient's well being in mind if that's in your mind your body language reflects that what you're saying to them they also understand and so sometimes even if you make mistakes they're able to forgive you to be honest i've noticed this uh, where i worked uh, mistakes have been made and i've been honest that yes i think we could have done this better and families tend to forgive uh, the third thing is good communication where you're actually sitting with them talking letting them know all the options uh, and giving them numbers uh, these numbers don't have to be real numbers just saying that patient is serious or uh, patient is getting better this doesn't help you say there's a 60% chance by tomorrow they'll get better uh, or there's a 40% chance that this patient will not i have seen around 10 patients out of 10 only two have survived with this kind of poisoning this is what we're dealing with these don't have to be accurate numbers it just has to be your experience in india uh, patients and family members need these numbers to sort of internalize what are the chances and how much they're spending is it worth spending that much or not spending so these are the three uh, i hope that was crisp uh, nitin right i don't think we have further questions and uh, um i want george to come on the stream as said george if you can switch on your camera yeah george thank you so much uh, for coming on short notice when i had sort of rounds and opd as such uh, for beautifully keep running the tech in the background and coordinating the speakers and the powerpoints uh, george is the current president of the student alumni i mean the not the alumni association but rather the student executive uh, committee of uh, st johns uh, who knows potentially 20 30 years down the line president of the alumni association but thank you george so much for keeping the tech running behind and coordinating the videos the slides and everything uh, we will let you go right now uh, to enjoy the sunday lunch in the mess and the uh, <laughs> sunday afternoon uh, jingle rock practice session that you have thank you so much Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Yeah. Uh, Murtaza, just one last question before we have our next speaker. I'm not able to see Dr. Uh, Ravi Narayan as uh, such. Uh, this, this is a topic that we discussed yesterday, and this I'm coming more from a wellness point of view, uh, that when people start off in the rural setting, uh, you're sort of alone. You may or may not be with a senior. Or you may or may not have senior doctors. Uh, so... again chris three points for maintaining wellness both physical and mental wellness in the rural center what would you like to say i think the uh, first thing is uh, journaling you huh? know have a diary or a or a notice or a whiteboard i have both at home i actually write down my plans uh, that gives me a, a great sense of clarity it's basically what is what is anxiety it's a sense of uncertainty 
and uh, to some extent that uncertainty can be taken away if you have a clear cut plan for example uh, when when say uh, on i go on a shift i'm like today i have these junior doctors x and y who are weak students today i'm not going to take any critical patient in my emergency or in my icu it's a fixed plan so there's no anxiety i, I just know it so i i do that and i also use a lot of reflection uh, keep, keep making notes okay this i've learned next time i'm not going to do this next time i'm going to do this so uh, that's one thing uh, takes away uh, you know put your thought on a piece of paper because in your head it can just go you'll go mad those thoughts will come play some tricks and leave but if it's on paper each time you'll be like what should i do what will i do tomorrow what will i do tomorrow is in the book go read it it's all written because you've made the plan yourself over and above that i would say that some form of physical exercise like uh, i i mean it could be anything don't think that physical exercise has to be perfect that you have to go to the gym and lift 100 kgs only then you're doing physical exercise or you're going to do 45 minutes of running anything and everything is okay in physical exercise is a rule of s's the three s's strength stamina and suppleness suppleness is flexibility do any one of those three so the days you feel like running go and build stamina days you feel like doing weight training do some push ups that's strength the days you don't feel like doing either of this just stretch do some yoga it's all part of the physical uh, wellness and the last one uh, the third thing i would say is is simply sleep hygiene please please understand uh, anything less than 7 hours sleep consistently has a direct correlation to mi which means that you may not be a smoker no cardiovascular no diabetes hypertension just no sleep for less than 7 hours for a period of years your direct correlation for mi so sleep well keep your phones away thank you very much <laughs> bye bye yeah uh so uh, i mean very important that you brought about the point of sleep in fact the iarc has classified nighttime shift work as a possible carcinogen also so not just mi uh, we uh, lot of experiments lot of research has gone on how sleep affects immunity Uh, and very important also that uh, i would also stress and advise try not to use your phone mobile phones for at least uh, 20 30 minutes uh, before going to sleep because the blue light which it em- emits uh, does impact the circadian rhythm as such yeah yeah i think it's nice to keep a couple of novels on your bedside i i do that mm-hmm. now i i read something to sleep it really helps so right right thank you so much uh, murtuza Uh, uh you can stay on and we will try and as usual namaskara big namaskara to uh, murtuza as such right um our next speaker uh very very fortunate uh, to have with us dr ravi narayan uh, he has been a pioneer in the field of community health uh, he is the co-founder and one of the chief founders of sochara which is an organization which was has been established uh, way back in the 80s and the 90s and really more than anything he has been an inspiring johnite an inspiring legend in the field of community health who has guided so many youngsters across the ages uh, he has had uh, my first interaction with him was way back in 2010 2011 when we started alter doctors and he wrote us a wonderful column called are you a tap turner or are you a floor mopper emphasizing the principles of community medicine so today before we have the uh, doctors in rural service who have completed their rural service from the batch of 2014 and 2015 uh, which dr ravi will also be engaging in an interaction with we want to listen to his reflections on how rural service started uh, for doctors in the 70s and 80s and also if he could share some light on the disaster relief work which has been done dr ravi a very good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us okay uh, i hope you can hear me uh, yes loud and clear okay i am not actually going to use any slides because i think they must have had enough slides and so sure. yes we want it to be engaging enough. interactive storytelling session and though i am in a storytelling mood usually nowadays especially since i am hitting 75 soon uh, i thought uh, is it possible to see the others or is it not possible in this format to be oh, able so, to see so we will be having a few of the uh, uh, representatives join us whom you will be able to see sir but oh, you can okay. start off and we will be adding them yeah. no okay no i just thought i i i usually uh, have some difficulty being an old old you know sort of veteran alumni to talk into cyberspace i usually like to see the people <laughs> i'm talking to but i presume uh, you are all there and yes. i'll get to this later 
a few of you are showing up. But anyway, that just to give me a little more sort of confidence. Let me quickly uh, first start by congratulating all of you. I don't know how many of you know that by this decision, whatever prompted you to make this decision, uh, and I don't go into those details because different people uh, would have made a diff uh, re the reasons for going to uh, complete your social obligation uh, may be uh, different. But I don't know how many of you realize that this act of yours, the last two years re requires a special congratulations, not only from me, but from the college, because that is the has been the dream of St. John's. So let me quickly start uh, by telling you a few things. Some of this you may have picked up already. Uh, some of this you may not. You know, the dream of vision of St. John's started in 1942, when a sister Mary Glowry in an, in an Easter retreat uh, after the retreat, she went and slept and she had a dream that there should be a medical college in the medical college in the Catholic Church. She, she is the one who founded the Catholic Health Association of India. In 42, she brought 16 Catholic hospitals together and, uh, you know, to form the Catholic Hospital Association of India. And believe it or not, today there are more than 2,500 hospital dispensaries and missions in the Catholic Health Association. They've changed their name from hospital to health. So she dreamt, and the reason she dreamt of it was that there was a shortage of doctors and she wanted men and women who would at least come out of a medical college committed for a few years of service. And that's how the dream started in 1942. And many of you may not know, because many of you may not have been, been uh, born in the years I'm talking about. Um, from 42 till 1962, the year when St. John's became uh, the living memorial to Pope, the first Pope's visit to, uh, you know, India. Uh, every year there was a hospital Sunday. And believe it or not, but this is true, and I'm, I'm, my history is all based on facts. There used to be a hospital Sunday every year and thousands and thousands of Catholics would fervently pray that there would be a medical college which would produce doctors and nurses and health staff who'd come and spend a little time out in the periphery in these small mission hospitals so that they didn't have to keep changing staff or have temporary. So many of you don't know that uh, this was the history and in 1962, when the Pope came, the Catholic Church and the bishops in their own wisdom said, we don't want to build one more church, one more, um, you know, a, mon a sort of shrine, grotto, whatever, to, to as a memorial to his visit. We must have a memorial, a social memorial, which will continuously live out this social vision of the church. And that is how this idea of outreach, today we have a, Vice Dean of Outreach after many years. We have ideas of rural bond and we're talking about community health. And slowly, uh, you know, uh, this has been a, a sort of a litany within St. John's, but it ultimately boils down to what you guys are doing. Um, in the past, and so let me continue after that. During the first 10 years, I'm batch of 19, those of you who don't know me, are I'm the third batch. Uh, the first batch was Mary Olapali, the dean, you know. Second batch was Prem Pius, the dean. And I am Ravi from the third batch, 1965 batch. Uh, and in the first 10 years, this idea was only given to us in some lectures by or some visiting, uh, you know, thing by the dean or a talk on Republic Day or the bishops or something that you must go to the village, you must go to the help. But there was no scheme, there was no way by which young doctors would go or not go. And in 1972, 10 years after St. John's had started, they did a sort of a, they asked the Alumni Association and we, we checked out how many people have reached the village and only for a short time. None, it was never mentioned that St. John's doctors should go and live in the village all their lives, but the doctors and nurses should go and spend as much as possible as a sort of social obligation in part of the social vision of the church. And so in 1972, it was found that except the sisters who 
who went to these small places because they came from them and their congregations were there. The lay people, very few, uh, there was Auburn, Jacob, and uh, maybe Kaveri and a few others. There were very few who had actually gone into a small mission hospital practice. And that is why very hesitantly, you'll be surprised that uh, when I can remember, I have it with me. I, today, I didn't want to wave all these at you in you know uh, on the online but maybe some other session in history the cardinals had written to uh, our parents that you know this is one of our visions and we hope that you will uh, do some you know go there and so on but there was no compulsion and after 10 years with much discussion and much uh, to and fro and good idea bad idea they finally decided to bring in a rural bond now the bond was small it's you know it it's got bigger over the years and initially the idea was it was just to 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 get young doctors and nurses to think that there is this social obligation so it was bond was not a very large amount unfortunately over the years it has become larger and larger which i am not very happy with uh, you know but that was because and as soon as the rural bond was started two of us prem pais and i the two young enthusiastic assistant professors at the time this was 1974 i think uh, kr antony's batch was kr was the first pioneer of the rural bond and we were made rural bond officers in addition to our other work so he was doing medicine i was in community medicine i had come back from england and joined uh, the department so the first thing the college did in 74 was change the name of the department from preventive and social medicine to community medicine Secondly, they had two young assistant professors, enthusiastic ones, Prem and me, offered to all the interns, saying, during your internship in St. Martha's Hospital or wherever you're doing it, be in touch with these guys and get their help to find a hospital of your choice, of your language choice, close to your parents if you want, or or you, you know, or even we did all sorts of strange things because young doctors like you were talking to young teachers like us okay and uh, all the way up to george disuza vijay all of the present professors are people i'm talking about we had chats with them we helped them find hospitals and you'd be surprised those days it was not focused on go and serve and you know be gandhian or follow albert schweitzer nothing of the sort we said you young doctors we know from those of us and i had worked in the refugee camps and i'd gone into community medicine even i did my thesis in london on training doctors that if you go to the rural bond and i this is a message i want to still leave with you those of you who have gone to the rural bond please do not consider this two years as if it's been a waste of time or it's keeping you away from learning more minutiae in all these uh, tutorials for you know the neat exams all of that may be part of your career in the future but four things are going to happen to you and i'm sure it will happen to you because you have role models all the professors in st johns who have done rural bond you go to any uh, staff member in st johns many of you don't know because nowadays the interactions are not so close as to whether they did rural bond but if they are a confident doctor if they make decisions on their own if they work well with teams and if they are always wanting to innovate in a low risk so they don't keep saying you know uh, if it's rather than saying we can't afford it can we do something else if we can't if the if patient can't afford brand can we give him generic drugs can we do something so he is there always aware of the socio economic cultural need of the patient if you find such a doctor i can tell you 99 to 100% he's been in rural uh, was places so i want to say the second point i want to say one is that after congratulating you that please see this as an opportunity i was so thrilled when st johns recently changed the name for years prem and i have told them don't call it rural bond these are not bonded labor to go there to some mission hospital and suffer there they have to be told it's a real opportunity this is the only time in your life you will be in a hospital where you will have to innovate your knowledge creative appropriate technology for low resource uh, situation so it's a it's like a startup for me i remember 
those of you may have heard this before. I don't know if some of, some of your batches I've talked to. When I was an intern, I went to the refugee camps. I was the first of a group. I'm considered one of the pioneers. But there are 25 of us who followed. Three of two people came with me. We went three months to the refugee camps of these Pakistan refugee camps. And I have photographs which I've shown some of the student batches where we actually built the hospital with bamboo. And, and you know, uh, so here we were. And when we told the army commander, hey, where's our hospital? He said, well, you'll have to build it. Now, we as Johnites were not ready for that. We hadn't been told how to build a hospital. But we used our common sense. Some of us were scouts. Some of us were NCC. We knew how to tie knots. With an, and the local people knew how to put together. And we built a lovely bamboo hospital. And everything from IV fluid stands to beds, everything is in bamboo and thatch. And it's there. I mean, I can show you photographs, which will be, it's there even on, I think it's soon going to get on the website. It's called the Bangladesh Chronicles. But the whole idea was that you start, and this is something which I want you to keep in mind. This is an opportunity. And so I like the word social obligation, but I wish it was finally one more turn. It will become the social opportunity. That means here is a time in your life when whatever you do, you tomorrow you might become a plastic surgeon, you might become um, a, a genetic specialist or whatever. In these two years, look around and see, can you leave that hospital? Can you leave the community with you work with a little more technologically savvy, a little bit more uh, knowledge wise, you know, health education wise, more informed? Can you leave it? And can you ultimately become what I say in Canada? When you go there, you will be called in various ways in different languages. Nimma doctor, St. John's doctor. He's a St. John's doctor. You know, he's come from St. John's or uh, you know, in Tamil, Kannada, Bengali, whatever. When you leave two years and you've really done things like little, little things to improve in the hospital, improve communications, improve whatever, you will soon become Namma doctor. And just watch out and see on the day of your departure, when the community gets together, or the sisters get together, do they talk about you as our doctor? not St. John's doctor. And if you've got that, I tell you, you've got the satisfaction of your life because the most beautiful that's, feeling for that's any young doctor... the most gratifying thing ever, the transition from... Uh, uh, now, so let, to, let me tell you doctor. another little story which many of you don't know because most of you know Mughalur as the big rural center. But in the first 25 years of St. John's and of which... Those first, I mean, the second 10 years, I was a staff member along with many others who continued. You know, a group of us, two bishops, uh, the dean, two professors of community medicine, two young assistant professors, myself and Dara, and a whole lot of um, enthusiastic tutors, Thelma, Shirdi, um, with all sorts of people, many of them who stayed on. We made six rural centers. I don't know how many of you are aware of Malur, India's first health cooperative, linked to milk cooperative, Silve Purania, Hesargata, uh, Bidrakupe, Huskur, Yadavanahalli. These are all villages you may have heard of, and Muglur. And the idea was that we used to get 12 interns uh, in, in, in a rotation of you know three, three months. And so we used to give them two, two in each of these villages. These were not the PHCs. This was not a big rural center like Muglur. It was a small little village place where either in the school, one room in the school or some place, we had a sociologist who would go and find a room that could be accessed by everybody, including the Dalit community. And St. John's would build a little latrine and a little kitchen sort of to that room. And two interns would stay there. And we staff, I, my, myself, Thelma, we used to go and live out with the interns because what's the point in teaching community medicine? You go to practice community medicine. So I remember living out with many of these guys in Bidrakupe school. And you'll be surprised our whole posting had only two important things. I'm saying that because you can bring that into your two years rural mode. One is that you work with that. You go to the community. Don't miss the opportunity. This is the only time in your life that you get an opportunity of being the doctor in the village, in the hospital, and then walking around the community. Attend their festivals, whether Diwali or Pongal. 
get to know the people and when the people start coming to the hospital and see you you'll suddenly find a completely different sort of relationship it is beautiful so now we just uh, we we just would like to hear some of them uh, because they are uh, due to get back to their uh, opd which they are doing on the uh, rural service also uh, so oh. we would be very grateful sir if you could stay on for the interactive session and listen to the stories from the current uh, bonders as such sure. uh, i might uh, okay for sure definitely yeah. i just want to I say one more thing before i finish that uh please write what you are uh, going through and that's the last thing point i want to make before you tell, i mean i definitely stay on and listen to all of you uh in fact i i don't think this is just the end of the beginning uh, please feel free to i already know many of you who i can't see you but i'm sure tejas and rahul and tanisha and all are here because they're all in touch with me in fact i helped them find the hospitals they went to but that we do st john's our sochara has always done that for anybody who It turns up you know a kilometer away from st johns to our center if they were looking for something very specific but anyway the most important thing is please write about it you know this is something which for many years now we have lost and i'm really happy now alumni association and um, bobby and all are beginning to restart the feedback from you about what is happening in those hospitals how do you feel your education has helped you uh you know do it or is there something that you can be taught about which you know uh, without this feedback you know these were the points that the batch of 2016 brought out yesterday and uh, which is what we are hoping to hear uh, multiple opinions so i would just like to invite uh, dr anthony robert uh, president of the st john's medical college alumni association to set the context of, for the uh, discussion that we are having with the doctors of rural service from the batch of 2014 and 15 who have joined us to share their experiences and i'm very delighted that dr ravi has agreed to continue to hear these expressions and also give us inputs and advice dr robert i don't have any yes. good good afternoon everyone dr ravi nice to see you and hear you and you uh, rest assured you're going to be integral to the efforts that the alumni association is doing to connect up with those in the bond centers and also in the non bond rural centers okay and uh, my dear uh, johnites out there uh, i'm really glad that this initiative has kicked off and with such active and enthusiastic uh, participation but i want to keep it as an ongoing activity and therefore i encourage you to 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 like dr ravi said to write and also to be in touch with uh, nitin and prithvi because we want to to make this a stronger initiative going forward and also to have it as a daily tool for people to refer back to when they when, when they need advice i won't take any more of the time i'd love to hear what the bonders have to say all power to you right so let's let's start with the batch of uh, 2014 who have just completed their uh, rural service as such uh, alex uh, rahul and uh, clive uh, with regard to um, when you started off your rural service what were the first few months like did you feel you were competent enough to deal with the cases uh, which were out there or how was the initial month experiences like we'll start with alex i'm assuming he was in role number 1 <laughs> or in the initial role number so we will start off with alex hi nathan uh, i hope i'm audible yeah yeah perfect go ahead okay. all right so uh, challenges as such the first day i still remember when i went there i had my senior who was there uh, who was doing his who was finishing off his uh, rural service there in that hospital i did my service in kerala st anne's mission hospital paiwal and dr akil was my senior so when i when i entered that hospital i still remember i had lots of fears like i i just knew i'm um, a good intern i i knew what all what all things to be done in a medical college setup when i have enough and more backup of doctors when i have like people to rely on if i have some doubt or something like that but in this center when i realized that i am going to be the only thing between uh, like taking huge decisions for a patient a uh, patient in crisis dealing dealing with family uh, managing uh, the, the the other medical staff as well uh, thinking about the financial aspects of the patient also like the lot of responsibilities suddenly coming on the shoulders so of the the first emotion being the overwhelming sense of responsibility as such like exactly. your opinion or your experience rather yeah I, i completely agree with alex in the sense that uh, 
I, I was it was overwhelming at the same time exciting for me because I mean this center where I worked in Chhattisgarh is something that I wanted to do myself and uh, I was more, I, I was really curious to know what's happening so each day was a different challenge for me and it was definitely I mean a lot of work I mean trying to figure out what to do for the patients but I I did have some support uh, in the form of other doctors and my my seniors there so So, so one thing which is very good. coming out is having some sort of senior doctor or even someone who is sort of overlapping and finishing makes a big difference as such. Uh, Rahul, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think I echo the same points that uh, Alex and Clive have said. When I joined, I was the sole doctor there. I didn't have any overlap with anyone. So going in, I felt uh, fairly underconfident and also quite uh, anxious about how I'm going to be treating these patients. Because even though we have read the books about which drugs we start, when we start them, actually doing that for the patient for the first time without anyone really looking over that is a bit uh, frightening when we first started out so i used to rely on what the previous doctor had written in her earlier notes for most patients and try to like uh, go along those lines first since so i didn't I have the important point again brings out the point that dr ravi was mentioning also about chronicling or making it down not just the reflection and experiences but how you manage the cases because if you don't have a senior doctor in your center like you experience then very important as to look at what the protocols are being followed there as such um, i'll come to tijo and sister archana and i would like you both i'm pretty sure that you echo the same experience and reflections but i would like you to comment on did you feel that your mbbs training and internship training was enough to help you deal and tide over the initial few months so uh, my experience was quite similar am i audible yeah yeah you are, you are. yeah Yeah, so my experience was quite similar to Dr. Rahul's. Uh, I work in a center where there's no consultant. So, like we said, and initially in the first day due to an emergency, the other doctor was not available. The person who was handing over, and then I had straight walked into the OPD, started seeing patients right from the first minute when I stepped into the hospital. So I felt definitely I felt overwhelmed on the first day, seeing the patients waiting outside, me being the sole consult, sole doctor available. But the moment I started seeing the case charts and i saw the drugs names and i saw okay this is very similar to muglo like when i was posted in muglo i had pgs there but i was seeing the patients i was uh, dealing with the patients and i was just discussing the cases through the pgs so we were in charge kind of and my experience was very similar to muglo and i think my internship was uh, good enough to train me and equip me to start my bond and i find i found within a day or within a week i was i knew this is going to be okay and i can cope up with it all right uh, any thoughts from uh, sister archana if you can unmute yourself and tell us yes sir am i audible yeah yeah, yeah. please go ahead yeah uh, good afternoon everyone and i consider this my privilege to share my experience so uh, i have i am working in a health center it's in a very remote village in tamil nadu So what i felt was before i could go i could select a center or i could go there i knew that i'll be the only doctor there and uh, for the past few years there was no doctor and only one doctor worked here so i took it as a challenging step so during my internship i uh, saw those internship days as a preparatory preparatory phase so i thought i could learn i should learn few things so that when i'm alone how could i manage so each patient when i saw in each department i thought i consider myself being alone in that situation so i took uh, situations like that and when doctors say few things i took it for myself and i wrote down notes uh, so i prepared myself during the internship phase so i uh, now i feel that it was uh, it has helping me a lot and what step by what i considered it was it is helpful for me so when i came into this rural area when i saw myself as an alone doctor beginning it was uh, it was during the covid time so i had a really challenging uh, time there because uh, till then there was no doctor and it is a remote village people really seek for help they don't want to go to other hospitals also so that time i was kept alone and uh, during the internship that one week of uh, uh, training in the covid uh, Uh, with covid patients in the medicine department helped me a lot so i took notes of all those things what doctors used to check so every time a very very important point being brought about that if you sort of make your decision earlier to decide to do rural service then possibly you can make use of your 
internship opportunities much better as such uh, i come back to alex i come back to alex and uh, uh, clive as such with regard to the challenges during internship to prepare now there was some feedback that internship is still a lot of clerical work and what you encounter in the rural areas is not something that you are taught in internship any thoughts on that or do you feel that the training was adequate enough for you to uh, deal with it or would you rather suggest changes to be done in the internship program which would help you better during your initial days uh, i think i'll go first uh, so uh, my internship i feel it equipped me to be a safe doctor i would say like at the basic level to find out what is wrong with the patient at, at least to get into a diagnosis to get a good history to get a good examination done and to make a differential till that point i am sure that the education st johns gave me and the internship training whatever i got from st johns it equipped me well for that and from that point onwards it's important when it's important for a graduate to know when to use help and who to who to call for how to how to get help so i think i i i was i was able to do that and that's that's how i i got through the initial phase of bond and another thing is whether there are uh, any changes that i would like to suggest from the internship passage i think it's uh, it's always i found myself always comfortable and better when i had john i pg as such who had done bond and what and, and then and and have come back to st johns to do their pgs since they have gone through bond they were well aware of the kind of situations that a bonder will face and uh, they were kind of preparing us uh, for the, those situations during the internship i still remember few of my pgs especially in pediatrics and medicine they called me took took some extra time and they taught me some basics about, about giving fluids for a child how to how to manage the initial a part of like most of the cases so such a very interesting point which was brought about yesterday which i will summarize once i hear from all of you uh, clive you are doing some remarkable work and working with the msf Uh, in some of the real rural areas, as such, uh, did you would you echo with similar sentiments of Alex? I mean, yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, internship definitely did yes, equip yes. me with some amount of uh, knowledge and strength, yes, basically, yes. to be a doctor in those areas. What I I would say was for me, basically, I, I, it was important for me to make a good diagnosis, make sure my diagnosis was right, and the management. again i mean this is something i picked up a bit during my uh, internship as well during my community medicine posting medicine posting surgery posting pediatrics posting i mean uh, these are the times when we were able to uh, interact with pgs especially in comed when we were, when i was in anikal i was able to treat patients on my own and this gave me some amount of confidence to prescribe certain amount of drugs i mean we uh, had a limited amount of drugs in front of me and what i used to do was just read about these drugs and read what's the first line what's the second line of treatment especially for diabetes and hypertension so during the internship is something this is what i picked up during internship and definitely it has helped gone a long way uh, and helped me a lot during my two years of rural service yeah so uh, that's what I, that's what i felt yeah so coming to uh, rahul so do you uh, i will just come to dr ravi after dr rahul that uh, do you feel so yesterday there was a sentiment that we are very good at diagnosing internship and the training that we get we are very good at diagnosing but most people echoed the thoughts that you know we don't know what to do next and when the patient is sitting in front of us we really don't know what to do next uh, what would you have to do you feel that a bridge course would sort of help uh, the bridge course has a lot of negative connotations in indian media today but do you feel that the bridge course would sort of help in bridging the gap between uh, between the period of internship to starting your uh, rural service or at least one to two weeks after you finish your rural service uh, nitin coming to the point of um, the management issue i think definitely when we are starting out we are definitely very um, under confident in how to manage the patient diagnosis i think they're all pretty uh, clear on like what um, investigations we need to get or history we need to elicit and our examination also to diagnose the patient but when it comes to um, actually managing the patient i think that's where we have a lot of issues i think in internship usually uh, the opd management of most patients we can really handle pretty well but when it comes to inpatient management that's when we get a little tricky because even in internship most of our inpatient uh, experience was mainly clerical work 
it was uh, organizing a lot of like scans or uh, tests for the patients more than being with the doctors on rounds and uh, discussing what's happening with all the patients coming to a bridge course um, i think it would be helpful but i'm not sure um, if just one whole course just for like a one day or two days would be helpful or if not like throughout internship have a course on for management like if i could give one example for like diabetes we know okay we can start these drugs we can escalate these drugs but uh, for the chronic management which tests do we get and how frequently do we test them those are things that i think we need to like focus on um, right. i think uh, we wanted to come here uh, with a point well actually you know i'm i'm getting a sense of deja vu because um, uh, i would love in fact i would say that as far as we are concerned in sochara i i hope that this uh, little discussion and my you know little input here was just a starting point for it is those of you who have not been in touch with us to get in touch with us you know i would love to send you the first letter written by kr about his experiences which he sent to me and uh, uh, prem pais because he wanted some changes in the curriculum kr antony the first one in 19 when he a few years later when telma and i had left st johns but we were still you know we are we are joined to a course so we not we never left st johns in a way just moved beyond the campus uh, we had a workshop you'll be surprised when there were 20 rural born candidates including mohan adhyam and george and all we had them all 20 come to st johns for a two day workshop one day was feedback to st johns and one day was feedback to mission hospitals and their management through the catholic health association and believe it or not i'll send you all these reports if you are interested because i think you'll suddenly discover gosh all the questions you are raising all the experiences you are finding have been raised before mohan adhyam and george and all went and rabindran went as young rural born candidates to a staff council meeting in st johns and presented to the heads of departments their uh, requests and i, I think it's a wonderful point that you're making the sir the catholic health association the director was called and we told him how to improve management strategies how to not use uh, st johns doctors like you know rural bond but also to you know treat them equally all sorts of things i want to go in detail but the more important one later thelma and i felt that rather than leaving it thelma me shirdi all of us in sochara rather than leaving it you know like open to an occasional letter we did a study believe it or not and i can send you that study supported by chai cmai icmr where we went to 50 young doctors in six uh, examination centers pg examination centers all of them are not johnites but all the present guys are there due to confidentiality we removed the names and all of them gave us feedback they took a paper home which i'll now share with nitin or maybe you could do it with you guys also the starting from anatomy till uh, you know clinical subjects and everything we had a questionnaire saying you just think of the two years we did it of course after you finished two years so some of it may be relevant you know like that what would you think should be taught in st johns and what should be taught and this published document is peer reviewed published document was sent to not st johns but to all the medical colleges that if you're preparing so i just want to summarize i don't want to give you more details of what was found i'd love to send it to you and really some of you volunteer to tell us do you feel the same thing still or have things changed out no, there I, i think i think we should carry out that exercise shortly and try to uh, collate and that's what we are trying to do collate all the experiences and a very important point that you brought out which i want to ask uh, dr tejo and sister uh, dr sister archana here that we have ta- been talking of the institute feedback but what is the feedback that you would give of the bond centers or the rural service centers whether they are actually providing you enough opportunities and support to improve your skills as a doctor so uh, the three main aspects where i received support from college okay where, where we need support is one administration administrative roles of the resident medical officer medical skills which uh, where the internship comes into play internship and uh, moglu all the internship experience counts there and then the management side and the drugs side of the rural medical officer but uh, where we need support from the hospital is where the administrative side is involved for example my center uh, there is a do- there is very uh, tight working uh, staff and account available so even for suturing when i have to suture when the light is not on 
I have to call another nurse for shining the torch for suturing. So what I did was I, I gave an alternative. I told okay, I'll get a headlamp, and then with the headlamp I can reduce the one ma- reduce the manpower required, and then I can work. The one thing which I noted was the administrative side. The administrator was very supportive. I was giving options which was way beyond her comfort zone. I told we'll order from Amazon. We'll just have to audit it and all that. She was open to everything, uh, provided I was clear in explaining what I wanted. So they were open to suggestions. They were ready to change uh, without burdening the workload, but uh, without burdening the nursing staff and all that. But they were open to change. And I think every center, center, center changes. I know a center which is four kilometers away from the center, which is very, uh, it's not cooperative at all. So there is two poles mm-hmm. apart. So Sorry. it depends on so the Arjuna, center. Your thoughts on this? Uh, one minute, Sister Archana. We have to unmute you. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I do agree the few things with Tijok said already. So in my center also, when I came in the beginning, the facilities were very minimal, and uh, it was very minimal. So I it took a lot of time for get to get adjusted with the difference from the hospital setup to the health center. So even minimal things, then I discovered myself like. Um, getting things uh, done, or we'll buy this, and with it, whatever suggestions I gave, they are obliged to all that, and they even medicines too, which they have been seeing already. But when I suggested few medicines, which I learned in Kim, so they were open to it, and I brought few medicines and uh, minimal uh, uh, like a suturing and a lamp torch, everything. What Tijo told few things, and uh, the disadvantage which I uh, noticed was. Uh, when they got used to the normal thing, means the routine thing, the routine drugs that the patients expect and they give. But when I bring a change, no, this is what we have to give. Even giving antibiotics for few days, not like regularly at the first visit and all. And giving IV at the first visit when the patients ask for it. So that few things I got, uh, I was not okay for it to accept whatever the patients ask for. So I make them understand, but even those moments. Uh, even uh, the staff who working with me, they tell no. The patients expect this. You have to do it. Otherwise, they will not come to us. They'll go to other doctor. So and this I think that is uh, one of the challenges of changing the mindset, which many of you have expressed to, to me individually and on different platforms. I want to bring Royson here, uh, who has been uh, sort of been a doctor in rural service himself and has guided many doctors under uh, him in the uh, Gudlu Radhivasi camp. Uh, Roy, if you're there and can unmute yourself. What are the biggest challenges which you or the doctors under you have faced in the initial months or year of uh, uh, serving in the rural area with regard to changing the mindset? Uh, thanks, Nitin. Nitin, hello everyone. Hello, Dr. Ravi. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, question and it's a major concern among a lot of uh, students who start on work. I think. Uh, the the thing that we have to realize is the mindset that we go with and the mindset that the already established bond center is are not in sync we go from a tertiary care institute and are uh, uh, we are likely to want to implement everything that we've learned like recently yesterday or a, or a week back during our internship bring the tertiary care to a secondary or a primary care and a lot of times it's not just the economic or the uh, or the logistic issues. It's also the social issues, the political issues as such. So uh, what my experience was that I was upset in the beginning that why why don't we, uh, when, when I suggest something, uh, there is, it's not getting implemented immediately. But then I realized that uh, the staff and the patients need to warm up to you. In the beginning, when you are trying to assess the center, remember that the center is also trying to assess you that are you trustworthy? Uh, you know, can they can they make decision based on your judgment? So that's going to take some time, and that may be even a year. So Nitin, I think uh, it's, it's I understand that you may want to bring changes, but don't be upset that the change is not happening happening immediately. You have to. There are more than one way to you know to bring about a change, and it may not have to just be picking a fight with your admin. You remember yeah, so that? Coming, like, yeah. Yeah. So coming yeah. back to Alex and Clive here. One experience that really changed your uh, sort of rural self, the two years in rural experience, which stands out in your mind. It could be positive, it could be negative, but one sort of experience that really stood out. Clive, you want to take this first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, 
this experience what i had was almost towards the end of my uh, rural service uh, it was basically uh, i had a few patients coming up it was uh, these tribal patients usually don't go to any uh, any other outside hospitals and uh, i i this is again i mean because of medical education i was able to clinically diagnose cutaneous anthrax in a few cases and i was suspecting cutaneous anthrax in a few of the population given the clinical picture then i had my uh, my senior doctor there and we spoke about it and we were pretty sure that there is there is definitely an outbreak in the community of anthrax and uh, yeah i mean because i was able to clinically diagnose these few patients we went on to lead a full blown uh, anthrax outbreak investigation in the community and yeah i was made the focal point for it and we did we did a lot of work trying to make this public but unfortunately given the political situation and the you know, situation there we were asked to shut up basically but we continued treating the patients and we saw complete improvement in those patients and yeah i mean so yeah that, that's that's really point. inspiring i mean anthrax something which again most of us probably read in books as such and then to have a live experience of it so rahul uh, coming to you as to yeah i'll just come to you again yeah Ra- rahul just coming to you uh, what is the challenge that you faced or the biggest challenge that you faced in two years where you feel you could have got more support um so the center i was working in the nursing staff is also my uh, boss so uh, navigating that uh, relationship is a bit hard i can see that everyone is smiling and laughing because no one wanted to tell it out till now but i i mean uh, look we are not doing this to criticize anyone this is just to get an experience to see how better we can also support us so yeah go ahead yeah so there are always situations where uh, if i could give a few examples like a patient came with the clear cut dengue i mean even the Uh, blood tests also were positive serology is positive for dengue and i uh, i told the patient okay you can like you know be admitted we'll give you a few fluids and the way the hospital works is they get admitted in the morning they will leave by evening and maybe come back the next day if they want anything more so i admitted him i went for lunch and by the time it was evening he had also been discharged and then he comes the following uh, day and he tells me that uh, you know doctor after i got that injection taxim then i started getting uh, it like uh, rashes and itchiness all over my body and that's when i find out that you know behind my back they were getting a few antibiotics just uh, put into them which i was not aware of i have not written and i told the patient i said i have not uh, asked you to get any injection or that he said i know i know but uh, the sister said you have to take this and she just uh, gave it to me so i think uh, situations like this actually uh, make us give us a bad experience of uh, bond and uh, even in opd basis also i've seen patients also get a few tablets that one prescribed like maybe a few vit- multivitamins if the stocks can really piling up in the store room and they want to like push it off then they cannot just keep putting putting it off saying the doctor has given this the doctor has given this yeah so i i think it's a very important point that you make that when suddenly your medical competence is being questioned or let's say the standard of care is not being followed and this was a point royson also brought about uh, it, it can pull you down mentally and it's not something which happens even in rural uh, practice even when you change from one institute to another and you're so trained to think in and perform your medical skills in a particular way and you see something being done to the contrary and against all evidence based medicine so to speak it can be mentally disturbing as such when you set out with different ideals uh, dr ravi you wanted to come in here yes i just want to say that you know i'm really thrilled at what you guys are saying because i i really appreciate i think to me that's the spirit of st johns you being so frank and i i would say be even be more frank because i am a great believer that what is what st johns lost for a while was feedback you know if if a medical college or a hospital or anything you run if the person who is affected by that in a medical college it's the student maybe student doctor student nurse maybe intern whoever rural bond scheme candidate if it's a, a hospitals where you're working it's the community unless you communicate with them and unless you create platforms where they can share about what they actually experience not what you think you are giving you know so just now when you gave a beautiful example that you sit with a patient and find out he's been getting other antibiotics that you never even prescribed now that is very important so i have a feeling this feedback will help because without this feedback loop what is happening a certain smugness comes starts with the medical college starts with departments starts with hospitals and we're all doing the best we can 
we are we're doing it for the sake of the patient but we are not seeing the great opportunity of young minds like you guys coming in with fresh knowledge with fresh ideas and giving them an opportunity so i so think the feedback, did, 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 did the feedback which i think is very important is not only should we get a feedback uh, from the students and you know help them through cmes and all we should feed back to the mission hospitals yes, and in that and that's, that's why the students and the college will have to do it not the students because the students would feel awkward but so, so. and you know we have started with um, uh, kaveri nambishan i don't know how many of you have attended that creative writing because you are communicating very difficult things to management to nurses to administrators and how you put it also is important so i can see there are many skills of management skills of communication which we should and so i just want to end with one small uh, suggestion which is given unfortunately didn't take place mohan and all when they first came said if we decide to go to rural born then either the last 3 months of our internship or give us an additional 3 months should be geared only for competence building not for more theory and competence of by people who've done this themselves you know not not uh, professors of remember professors of any medicine only know tertiary care and they're all teaching primary care so you have to bring in primary care physicians from the uh, rural hospitals and now there are so many good ones both in st johns and the larger so i think this feedback well, is I very think, i think that last I one which you made guys, is something and i would say this we are very happy to please start yeah, correspondence with us chcravi@gmail.com and we can send you lot of interesting materials in the past and you can contribute to it by saying is it still relevant is something else happened okay so yeah, i think the last it. point that you brought about was very valid point which alex brought about that when he had pgs who had done their rural service together and exactly. came uh, he could uh, sort of relate and get trained better uh, which is where uh, on the point you brought about yes alex go ahead uh, i think uh, uh, this is a very good initiative that the alumni has brought out uh, now like i think uh, we can start something like a bond a startup package or something the next batch that's going to start the bond just before joining like we can uh, alumni association and the previous bonders together like we can conduct something like this and give them basics of ecg basics of initial management something like that it would it would help us and them as well like yeah, so that's that, that's the point i was actually coming to ask uh, tijo and uh, sister archana as such that what are the resources that you find lacking when you enter and what do you feel can be done for it so where do you turn for help or who do you turn for help so i'll go with the second question first so in terms of help the most uh, useful resource was the bonders who are in the previous uh, as in my immediate seniors who are actually fresh in bond or who have had one year of experience they would know the scenario what is working what are the medications which are usually given in fact the most amount of help came from one person on this call alex was the one who was my first helpline second uh, or third would be john and academics group i agree but uh, definitely the first call it would be easier on a call so i would definitely call one of my seniors who would be available in a bond center the second thing i would suggest would be uh, something which was recommended yesterday also a mentor system would be great because i remember having a mentor during my ug days but which was discontinued towards the later end of it i think a mentor who is in somewhere related to the center maybe someone who had worked in the same center or someone who has worked in this uh, nearby vicinity anyone like that who can be the first point of contact for anything not not just academic stuff anything that is logistical or anything related even loneliness is one thing which we don't uh, talk about much so true, true, mostly absolutely. in bond centers uh, so, sister achana your uh, comments on that as to where would you turn for resources or what resources would you find i uh... usually got some resources before coming here that i got in contact with some of my pgs whom i work with so immediate uh, help i asked them at once i message and they to respond at me and other resources my the notes and the books which we have already read so i turned into it and few doctors from st johns whom i uh, usually call and ask help so these were my, my main resources apart from it i Uh, got contact with few doctors in and around my setting the few in few hospitals of the different departments 
so i got contact i visited them and i personally told that i'll be referring patients to you and i'm working here so in that way i referred many of my patients to them right uh, also very important i mean uh, and really this was the initiative like what alex was saying which when my batch started doing the rural service the whole point of doing the jonite academic whatsapp group was not only to have the professor and the faculty members but be a group where there are people who have done the bond or the rural service in the previous years so that they would be able to help out better and the other advantage of the group as such is of course someone would be awake at all points of time like clive here is right now in uk so even if it's night time in india it would be evening in uk and he would be able to reply or answer as such as you would always have someone in the group active at all points of time and link you up and in fact i remember at one point of time one of the cases which the batch of 2014 had put out we were getting in super specialty references and telling what exactly to do so i always say that you know even now on behalf of both alta doctor the alumni association and everything out there that help is always available it's just that people have to not feel scared about it people should not feel that anyone is being judgmental i think one of the main concerns that came out yesterday was that if they post something in the group uh, what are people going to think about me are they going to think that i am not trained or is someone junior to me going to think oh this fellow is my senior but he doesn't know this much so i think it's very important in the context of delivering patient care that one should always not feel that the other person is judgmental because we are all here for knowledge and trying to learn to give better patient care so i'll end with a quick set of questions and we will start with clive who has woken up quite early on a sunday morning uh, in london as such to what suggestions would you give to improve the rural experience what would you like the institute to do what would you like the alumni association to do and any deficiencies that you noted which you think can be improved upon yeah uh, thank you for the question nitin uh, as you all mentioned that dr ravi mentioned before i feel there was definitely a feedback system lacking uh, when we did our bond and also during internship in in fact i mean we had a feedback session after our internship but that was basically us scribbling about what was not right and nothing being done about it but i feel there should be a formal system where uh, this is this is my opinion that different departments are graded at least in the sense that how much clinically they're teaching or how much support they have uh, from the pgs and maybe it should to make it less of a criticism and more of a, a motivation it should probably become some sort of uh, what do you call it like how you give the best teacher award there should be a best uh, department award for the interns where where they have been taught i think this could be a positive way of basically trying the departments to also get involved in more teaching for the interns in the same way i feel uh, for the uh, bonds and for the centers that the, that we are going to there should be a formal uh, evaluation form at the end of our bond which should be available to all the future bonders uh, for all the uh, doctors undergoing the service in the future and also uh, it should be available openly in, in in our colleges it should be on the notice boards just to see i mean like you know which bond centers are actually good i mean these reports should be out in the hospital so that everyone can see and everyone will know about it in that way i feel there would be some amount of uh, accountability on 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 behalf of the bond centers as well i think that's a really fantastic point of uh, uh, how to evaluate a center and sort of not evaluation from the institute but the people who have actually worked there as such very very brilliant point as such i still remember as students or uh, jino me and dr binu had sort of created a website but that was more again more of information based website of uh, or what are the kind of patients the patient load the salary but i think a review system and today we talk about google reviews for everything but i think having a review system by the people who have served there very important rahul and alex your thoughts on uh, what uh, uh, suggestions from the institute from the alumni association to cover any lacunae or deficiencies uh, i think the institute should be a little bit more involved in uh, the bonders going there i think we felt like we were just like we could just pick a center and that was it we didn't have any other contact with our uh, institution uh, because i we had a few uh, like few of my classmates where they were working in a center and they were being paid less than the other doctors of the same uh, like resident doctor post 
and when they ask like you know why are these people being paid more than we are we have got we get the response that oh you all are bonders so this is how much bond we pay for bonders for uh, other doctors we pay them more i think that also gives us a sense of uh, you know like we are yeah. in a way how uh, dr ravi narayan said makes us feel like bonded uh, doctors as such another thing is uh, uh, rightly rahul brought up the issue of uh, like being uh, paid at different levels in the in different places so uh, that has to be looked at uh, more than, uh, that's one thing other uh, things are uh, most of these bonders we are just finished uh, our mbbs and we are looking to build our career so this anxiety of getting into a pg seat like go, uh, do, doing neat or like uh, choosing any other alternative pathways Uh, so this anxiety and then how to work for that like continuing the professional development as such that's a, a very important topic that has to be discussed and ways to do all these things like uh, for example we can even think of doing researches from these bond centers or it's or multiple things multiple studies the other day i was listening to the talk given by uh, dr salim yusuf uh, from uh, uh, from this channel so uh, i was so marveled and i was so taken aback by the Uh, amount of activities and amount of things that they did during their time in the rural service like he went went around like chlorinating wells uh, like uh, ensuring uh, free and uh, good uh, water for everyone there so uh, i i'm just thinking in in this current generation of jonics why are not such studies or why are not uh, why are not there such initiatives where where the doctors actually go into the community work with the community to make a significant palpable change in the community why such things are not happening it's more uh, or less I like think, a i think OPD that's a visit. very fantastic uh, thought and i can see dr ravi smiling because i know that uh, during the story we brought about that uh, dr ravi in fact gave this idea to dr salim yusuf about the pollination of wells and I, i i would just echo what dr ravi said that you know reach out to uh, reach out to organizations like sochara uh, reach out to sgri or anyone any of us who is also interested in research and we would be able to help you uh, yes dr ravi so just one quickly thing i'm just overwhelmed by the fact two things one is that uh, the most interesting things you are saying but what really worries me in a way as you reach 75 and you know you think back at st johns what you've just finished saying I, unfortunately i can't read your names too well because you're coming too small and some of you are familiar faces but i don't know the names but what you just have said you know sadeen went and did these two studies as an intern because in those days i remember when i came back from england thelma i mean and then dara uh, joined also after he finished his md we used to ensure that every intern whether he was posted in muglur budrakuppe who score silverpura malu did a project and the project was a clinical project not a community medicine because we had said this is artificial divide what is this community medicine versus clinical medicine psm versus clinical this is rubbish every doctor who is a good doctor must have a psm orientation must have a community understanding but is a good clinician so every whether it's george whether it's vijay whether it's sanjeev everybody who asked them during this three months they had to find one area they just in pediatrics so look at child uh, issues they looked at geria whatever and collect all the cases that they were finding difficult to deal with because it was either more secondary tertiary or something and then keep them all ready for a camp and the every saturday when they came back they'd go to the clinical departments and get that particular clinical departments interested and we'd have a camp on that it just so happened that salim went further he wanted water and sanitation and so the community medicine department supported the study and every intern i can send you copies of interns studies done by all these guys they no, did it in the reason, they, the, uh, the reason they did an internship was we wanted them to get an idea when they go to rural bond they should be able to do their two years they're here they have only three months so the internship studies though, though i must say salim and kk james published we published all together munar having endemic goiter there was enough data in there so i fully agree and i'm thrilled at some of the suggestions you guys are making but i'm a little worried why is it that we are repeating it all these stories which have just now for prem pais and i had to handle in the first four years of rural bond one of which was just one of you said that somebody got paid more we wrote to those hospitals these are not bond if you're giving a young doctor Uh, 15000 rupees you cannot give a bond 10000 you have to give him 15000 
I mean, it doesn't make sense. What is a mission hospital? You're an ethical place, no? Or an unethical place? You have to challenge them. You are. You guys can't challenge. We guys can because we're assistant professors or associate professors. Or and Saint John's is the apex of the mission hospital pyramid. So I think Saint John's, the institution and the college department heads. So I even love this idea of which one of you have suggested that the department that reaches out and prepares interns the most should get recognition, not individual teachers. The department are they interested in you beyond the rural bond? Because I think the rural bond is the best time for doctors in Saint John's teachers to see have we taught correctly. If these guys and the fact that you guys are very confident is also a manifestation of good medical education, but on so many areas, you know, uh, emotional preparedness. How do you talk to management? How do you suggest better drug? Uh, you know, things. All this has come up before, and I think. Alumni Association is really would I congratulate them though I'm part of it uh, in really making this opening and we mustn't stop at this little uh, workshop. It should be the start or end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. And we must really build up. And I'm sure with Nitin and uh, Robert and Prithvi, something more concrete can come up where the institution uses the feedback. You know, there's no question of feeling bad about it. Without feedback, no nobody can grow. Uh, and so that's I'll, very I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with the Tijo and sister Archana and Alex brought about a very important point about neat PG and uh, preparation. So how much does that weigh in your mind, especially when you're coming towards the end of the bond? And are you looking for any support from the Institute or the alumni associations? So for me, even during the first few months of bond, I, bond, I hadn't decided what pathway would I would follow. And I had always decided, okay, after internship, when I'm in bond, when I have some peace of mind, I'll decide. And based on even the PG specialty, which you want to take, all that decision came during the bond. So bond is an excellent time to give me insight of what I want. Uh, from an institution, I am in the UK, PLAB route now. And what uh, Alex said is very significant because competency building is lacking in uh, Indian uh, settings. So for example, audits, uh, research, research, all that is voluntary. And I agree. But uh, some form of auditing to be done, even during, in your bond centers, if there's an opportunity to link up with IEC and link back to the St. John's campus. And if we are able to do, do some studies, even during a bond, which is actively promoted, it will be great. Second would be uh, not related to the PG, PG pathway, but the feedback. Feedback is very important. I believe Dr. Bobby has already started some work on collecting report, reports of the bonders and of the centers. But there is no endpoint to it. Like there is no active feedback given back to the centers, or no action taken based on the feedback. And a review system would be excellent, like Clive suggested. If there is a common portal where we, where the students, especially in the current days, now we, now the current batch is finding it very hard to find bond centers. One fifty students are fighting for bond centers, so it's it's pretty hard. So it, there's a common place where we can access the reviews. And any feedback from the people who have done work there, it would be excellent. So, Tachana? Now the bond, centers, bond center has taught me a lot and uh, made me to see in which field I can go ahead and in which field I'm interested or I, I can make myself efficient. So, still on the process. And uh, during, in between some free time or this, I have... Uh, I think we lost lost her uh, connection. But anyway, uh, what we would like to assure you, at least I speak on behalf of the alumni association here, is that there are there's a very little thing that we can do in terms of the institutional uh, what it can do. But from our side, we definitely will act as the voice. We definitely will collect this feedback, and we will be the connect. And what we sort of spoke yesterday and in my individual conversations with Rahul, Clive, Tijo and all that we have had is, I think it's very important to also look at a mentorship system where how you have mentorship in college, it's very important that when you guys move out into the rural service area, you still have a mentor to fall back upon. That one point of contact you can relate with, not just for academic doubt, it could be an ophthalmologist for all you know, but someone who's there to guide you through the terrain, to help you deal with the administrative problems that you face and to help you even on your career development. I think that is something that we should look at, not just from faculty within the institute, but even outside like uh, institutes like Sochara 
or the alumni who are not in jobs but working in rural areas and it doesn't have to be anyone above you yourself can be mentors i feel even people like clive rahul alex tijo everyone all of you who have been there done that need a connect and that is where as the alumni association we can actively work and uh, you brought about a very important point of research as such and you know there are even among the youngsters though not as level like i know clive rahul is doing some research now there are people who are engaging in research and again just about establishing that connect and saying that hey we are there we will listen and that has been the uh, sort of intention of this whole endeavor from the alumni association and like i said personally on the group we started the group much before uh, in 2013 individually and few of us we can vouch for you personally that we are there at any point of time to support you and with that i think we would end this uh, talk yes rahul come in come in um no nitin just for like advice for uh, bonders now and like bonders who come in future i think uh, clive and i were discussing a lot of them have uh, issues with uh, guidelines and like how to initiate treatment and stuff uh, so what uh, we used to use was up to date where we used to make one through st john's account and we used to use that resource and uh, update our knowledge so if you see a patient and we are not too sure about how to proceed with them we probably start initial management and then later on when we had free time we probably use that resource and go through the guidelines so that we had yeah, no, i'm glad you brought it up uh, which is i mean uh, we'll just stretch it for a little more with this question to clive that what would you think that and this is an idea which i was uh, sort of talking about yesterday where let's say every month we take a topic like hypertension diabetes the bonders provide us three topics and every month we discuss the guidelines on the topic because as the common feedback is everyone knows how to diagnose but no one knows how to treat when to call up for follow up like for example okay bp is 150 90 you start with single antihypertensive or dual antihypertensive what doses uh, when do you call back what would you is, do you think there is a need for that yeah i think it's a brilliant idea uh, discussing uh, topics are always a good thing i mean even if uh, you're just watching what's the discussion you would take away something from it in fact i mean all the guidelines that we put up on the academics group the, uh, the john eight academics group i still use them i mean the hypertensive guidelines or there, there are so much material out there and as rahul said i mean there, there are many resources that that are available maybe the bonders are not really aware of but i feel yeah if there is a, some sort of teaching on the group maybe all of us can take some turns to discuss it exactly topic. and and that's what we are sort of uh, looking at yeah. and uh, and in, in fact i had kept a backup talk of mine called how do you access the latest uh, uh, medical news and how to keep yourself updated but we will do it uh, some other time thank you all so much thank you specially to dr ravi and I'm, i think dr telma was also listening there in the background so thank you thanks to both of you for joining us such celebrated uh, luminaries in the field of community health thank you to all the rural service doctors and sisters across the country not just jonites even those who are non jonites who are serving out we recognize you and we applaud you and really look at it as an opportunity which some of us we have not been able to do and this is just a small way that some of us who have actually not been able to participate in rural service try to make our own small contribution to thank you once again to alex rahul clive tijo uh, yes dr ravi we leave the last word to you uh listen i would i'm so thrilled with listening to what you guys are doing uh, and uh, i would tell nitin to share my phone number so that we can set up a whatsapp chats between one to one i'm already in touch with 40 alumni because i do it like my like a hobby now uh, i think that's my role now when you reach 75 you sit back and you listen to whatsapp of what young people are doing so already 40 alumni of different batches all the way up to nitin are in touch with me about what they are doing and they ring me up regularly i love to do that uh, so i am sort of like a rural bond uh, you know supporter at heart so please i'd really love to chat with some yes, of sir. you about some of the brilliant ideas you have written i made a note but since i am not familiar with all your no- names just send me a whatsapp if you've got the time and we can chat and i'll send you a lot of material you'll be surprised we're all very johns oriented there's so much going on in india around in other colleges all over the world and all these guidelines and all for primary care is like uh, you know the you got a journey to set up a whole website and wikipedia on it but people don't seem to know about it i think so i'm sure i'd love to share all this with you 
and go beyond what one of you said brilliantly was let's not criticize let's get on with you know what to do and i think that's a brilliant uh, ending to what you guys have done so all the best sorry for butting in but it was just a sign of you know yeah. and and you are allo getting very this is a passion that inspires things. a future and the spirit of passion that comes out which really okay, inspires bye. the future bye. thank bye. you so much alex rahul plaiven tijo and thank, thank you, you all for tuning in thank you so bye much bye. thank you thank you thank you nitin